Thank you. And I'll call to order this special meeting of the Board of Supervisors, May 31st, 2022. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Supervisor Hart. Here. Supervisor Nelson. Here. Supervisor Lavanino. Here. Supervisor Williams. Here. And Chair Hartman. Here. Please stand and join me with, for the pledge. CEO Miyasato, do you have a report for us today? No report this morning, Chair. And clerk announcements. Chair Hartman and members of the board, I just have one quick announcement this morning. I'd like to remind the public who are participating in our meeting today of the board's updated methods of public participation. For the Board of Supervisors methods of public participation and to provide public comment on general public comment or an item on the board's agenda, please see page two of the agenda. Members of the public can attend meetings in person both in the Santa Barbara Board Hearing Room Chambers as well as the Santa Maria Board Hearing Room Chambers. Please note the board is following all local and state guidelines and are no longer requiring face coverings indoors. If you attend the board meeting in person, you will no longer be required to wear a face covering, but please be advised that the Public Health Department is still strongly encouraging all county staff and members of the public to mask and socially distance themselves in crowded areas. I would also like to remind the public that if you require any special accommodations, please contact the clerk of the board to make that request, preferably on the Friday prior to the board meeting. Individuals that would like to provide verbal public comment virtually may do so via Zoom by registering in advance via the link available on page two. After registering, you will receive a confirmation email containing important information about joining the virtual meeting. Once the chair has announced the item you want to comment on, please join the meeting with the information provided in the registration confirmation email. You will be placed on mute until it is your turn to speak. The clerk will call you by name. And when removed from mute, you will hear a notification that your line has been unmuted. If you are using a touchtone phone, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. Again, if you're using a touchtone phone, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. Each person may address the board for up to three minutes, and this is at the discretion of the chair. If you have any questions, please contact the clerk of the board's office at area code 805-568-2240. Again, that's 805-568-2240. That concludes my announcements today. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Turning to our administrative agenda, do any board members have any items you'd like to pull? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, do any members of the public ask to pull any item on the administrative agenda? Chair Hartman and members of the board, we have no request to speak on the administrative agenda from the public. So may I have a motion to approve A1 through A14 on our administrative agenda? So moved. May I get a second? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Now for general public comment, items not on today's agenda, but within the purview of this board. Do we have any general Commenters today, Madam Clerk? Chair Hartman and members of the board, we have no request to speak on general public comment today. All right, turning to departmental item number one. Would you read that into the record, please? Chair Hartman and members of the board, departmental item number one is from the Public Health Department. It is a hearing to consider recommendations regarding an ambulance service contract policy, resolution, and ambulance services update. Dr. Del Reynoso. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, um, before we start with the staff presentation, I am going to give a brief overview. Um, but before we start with that, I did want to say that um, because we have potential private and public bidders for the request for proposal to ensure pro procurement pr integrity, uh, we recommended that all county departments wall off county staff that have been advising and or supervising the LEMSA on the ambulance service procurement from any county staff advising or supervising the county fire district. And so um, just we take a deep, uh, just a short break um, and allow CEO Miyasada to leave the room um, because uh, Assistant CEO Terry Masnisich is the CEO's representative for the RFP. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Van Mullen, would you like to now, while you have the floor, just give us a brief overview of some of the uh, 
issues that we must bear in mind as we consider this RFP? Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and just to reiterate, we've, we've had a wall to separate people on one side or another, and so now that's on the record. And it's, it's been awkward, but we've nonetheless uh, <laughs> followed your advice. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. So I'm going to just talk briefly about the board's role and LIMSA's role in this process. So the board of supervisors um, serves as the LIMSA's awarding agency for ambulance services procurement. So as the awarding agency, the county board of supervisors award the, awards the contract resulting from the competitive process. In addition, um, the state recently enacted AB 389, which does a few things, uh, but one of the items it does is requires the Board of Supervisors to adopt, by ordinance or resolution, a written policy which sets forth items, issues to be considered for inclusion in the emergency ambulance um, prior to awarding any contract or renewing a contract. So that's something that's uh, before your board for consideration today. So in sum, the board's actions um, include approving the ambulance RFP for public release, which is before your board today, uh, providing feedback on the request for proposal, which you'll also be doing today, um, the policy required by AB 389, uh, which is also on your agenda, and then the final step after the request for proposal is complete would be awarding the emergency services contract. This process is governed by um, the State Emergency Medical Services System Act, and um, it was and Pre-Hospital Emergency Medical Care Personnel Act. We call it the EMS Act, which was adopted in 1980. And so that's what's governing our process today. And in order for uh, the board to award an exclusive contract, there's two ways to do that, um, two mechanisms in state law. One is a competitive procurement, which is what your board has directed the process to be, or, or grandfathering of the existing provider. And so we are in the midst of this um, competitive process. Um, as part of that, uh, the board has discretion to provide input on contractual matters uh, related to the RFP. Um, as far as the LIMSA's role, uh, in order for the county to have a local emergency medical systems program, the county must des designate a local EMS agency. And the county has designated County Public Health as the local EMS agency, which we refer to as the LIMSA. And on the RFP, matters are, that are in, within the medical control of the EMS system are within the jurisdiction of the LIMSA. And I'm happy to address any other questions. While we have you, um, will you talk a bit about direct assignment? Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, sure, I, I'm happy to do that. Uh, as I said, we are governed by state law. So the only way under state law to establish an exclusive contract, an exclusive operating area, is through either grandfathering the existing provider or a competitive process. So that's the path we're going down now is the competitive process in order to establish this exclusive contract. Uh, in order to do any kind of direct contracting, you either need to do that at the end of your competitive process or the contract that you end up with is non-exclusive. And would you just describe what non-exclusive might lead to? Sure, Madam Chair, I can start with that, and then we might want to um, have either our consultant or county staff explain. Um, but when you develop an exclusive operating area, it allows the county to contract with one provider to serve that area so that you don't have competition or any misunderstanding of who's providing the services. So that's just a general overview, but I'm happy for Fitch and Associates or for um, county staff to add to that. So, well, yes, and I, I just think it's important to understand we're working on the RFP, we're doing that because it's required if we want an exclusive contract. We've explored other options and those aren't available to us or aren't a good way to go. So just if you would talk about uh, 
what happens if there's a non-exclusive operating area? Sure. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Steve Knight with Fitch & Associates. I'm a partner with, with the firm that's been uh, assisting, you know, in the, in the procurement and the RFP process all along. But I, I, I think Council did a good job of describing what a, what a non-exclusive area would include, and there's some unintended uh, potentialities about, you know, different services competing. You may erode some of the service level and professionalism that you, that you currently enjoy through, through the setup that you have. So I, I think um, overall, the best practice is usually to have an exclusive area uh, in a competitive process. Because otherwise you might have too many people or too many ambulances in one area that's more lucrative and you may not have enough in other areas that are less so. Is that correct? Yes. Socioeconomic, other, other factors that influence a, a capital environment for sure would, would erode some of that. So some of the protections that are built in uh, that the county currently enjoys uh, certainly goes a long way to normalize some of those to ensure that there's a commensurate level of service uh, based on the population density. And Mr. Knight, just one other preface question. Um, this is a very unusual RFP. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. So uh, again, this is, this is unique from the standpoint that the board's uh, initial direction uh, to start the competitive bid process was to make sure that the bid was open and inclusive enough to uh, allow a public entity bidder uh, in the process rather than more, the more traditional uh, private only that, that California has pretty much lived on for, for a very long time. So a lot of the process was, was uh, from a high level, was worked on under that, that pillar, if you will, that tenant, that it had to be able to accommodate a public uh, potential bidder. So the way we approached it, not knowing what that potential bid would look like, we tried to keep things broad enough to handle an all public bid, a public private partnership bid, and a, a typical more traditional uh, private potentiality for, for bid. So from that perspective, what it hasn't really materially occurred uh, in the state of California yet, so this is, this is quite unique. Uh, you know, there's been some attempts that, that haven't gone in the right direction for various reasons. Um, you know, one county uh, did, a, did an alliance model with a public-private partnership that did have a couple bumps in the road that uh, they're having to go back out um, for a bid in the not too distant future, but uh, it's certainly uh, what you're doing here in the county of Santa Barbara is, is what we believe is the future, uh, at least for California, to be able to accommodate the nuance that you have uh, by your EMS Act. In other states, the county board would have authority to, to award you know, to a public agency if they wanted to. So it, it is quite unique. Yeah. So this is the first of a kind in California? Yes, to my knowledge, yeah. Thank you. So Dr. Dorenoso, uh, now starting with you. Great. Um, good morning, uh, Chair Hartman and members of the board. With me today, joining in person, is Dr. Daniel Shepard, our Emergency Medical Services Agency Medical Director, Joining me on Zoom is Nick Clay, our local emergency medical services agency director. And as you have met, uh, joining the county team is our consultants for the RFP from Fitch and Associates. We have Steve Knight, Thomas Moore, and Guillermo Fuentes. Um, this morning, the county team will be presenting the policy for emergency ambulance services contract and the AMR agreement extension. The Fitch and Associates team will be presenting the key elements in the RFP. Recommendations for your board's consideration include to adopt the attached resolution, attachment A, adopting a policy setting forth issues to be considered for the inclusion in contracts for the provision of emergency ambulance services entered into or renewed on or after January 1st, 2022. Also, to approve and authorize the chair to execute a fifth amendment to the professional services agreement with American Medical Response West, or otherwise known as AMR, to update the vehicle maintenance program 
to update the lame duck contract termination provision and to extend the termination date to March 1st, 2024 to allow for the completion of the ambulance services requests for proposal process. Also, to approve and authorize the Public Health Department Director or designee to authorize AMR's requests in accordance with Agreement Section 11.1.G upon review and approval from the CAOs, Auditor, Controller, and County Council. With respect to the RFP for an exclusive ambulance services provider for the Santa Barbara County Exclusive Operating Area to approve and authorize issuance of the RFP or to provide staff with other direction regarding further development of the RFP. And lastly, to determine that the proposed actions do not constitute a project within CEQA. With that, I transition to uh, Nick on Zoom. So in an effort to ensure the ambulance RFP is able to be completed with enough time for a ramp up timeline or a lead time for a new provider to acquire ambulances, the EMS agency negotiated an extension with American Medical Response, AMR, with the end date of the contract now being March 1st, 2024. Additionally, the mileage cap or limit for the primary ambulances was brought in line with the current RFP as drafted to 250,000 miles. Lastly, the lame duck language was given a little bit more structure to provide um, the ability for the public health department or an EMS agency to address requests AMR may have in the event they do not win the RFP and become a lame duck. Next slide. <clears throat> so we were asked to provide a uh, sort of policy crosswalk, um, looking at the proposed policy and how they uh, those elements were introduced into the ambulance RFP. So in front of you, you have um, essentially a high level overview of each element. Um, and where it can be found in the RFP. As we uh, walk through just a couple of high level items, um, so the treatment of the incumbent workforce, um, the contractor is encouraged to recruit from and preferentially hire the incumbent paramedic and EMT workforce. And it was the LEMSA's goal to ensure the contractor initially and throughout the term of the agreement provides a financial benefit to encourage employee retention and recruitment. There are provisions for disaster response, including a requirement to support mutual aid, there's an establishment of minimum qualifications that allows or uh, requires the potential bidders to demonstrate fiscal stability and prudence, as well as a stable track record of emergency, non-emergency and urgent ambulance service. We've gone through with diversity, equity, and inclusion requirements or suggestions. The contractor shall provide uh, services without regard to race, color, national origin, religious affiliation, age, sex, or ability to pay, and ensure courteous professional and safe conduct of all their personnel. Um, there are financial requirements to ensure fiscal stability and depth within the system. Um, there's a cost recovery consideration to ensure that the contractor is, has the mechanism to uh, reimburse the county for its efforts. There is public information education requirements um, that ensure that there's an outreach element to uh, from the contractor to the community. Um, and then there's ongoing workforce development requirements. Um, to ensure the proposer is required to document their commitment to have key personnel actively participating in a quality management system. And then last but not least, uh, wage and benefit staffing protections um, to ensure that the uh, staff are uh, paid in association with their, in line with their current payment, if not, um, and benefits package to ensure that there's no reduction in, in those elements either. Thank you, Nick. And uh, I'd like to transition and invite Fitch and Associates to give um, their presentation. Madam Chair, before we go to Fitch, I would like to introduce our consulting team, just so folks are aware, since they've already had a chance to speak. Uh, Dr. Steve Knight, who you've already met today, is a partner with Fitch Associates, and he leads the firm's fire service practice. In that role, he's led numerous assessments of major cities and other agencies. These often include standards of cover review, including strategic planning services. And Dr. Knight also brings to the firm over 25 years of fire and EMS experience. He is, a, he is retired, the retired assistant fire chief for the city of St. Petersburg, Florida. And he's been a subject matter expert for both the National Fire Academy Center for Public Safety Excellence. And he's also served as a team leader and assessor for the Commission on Fire Accreditation International and has held mul multiple faculty appointments in fire science and EMS. 
Also joining us today is Mr. Guillermo Fuentes. He leads the communications and technology practice for the firm. His experience is in public safety operations, communications, technology, and senior administration is, is very wide ranging. He is a leading expert on the analysis, design, and deployment risk and risk management for public safety agencies. And he supervises statistical and operational analyses, computer modeling, and the development of deployment plans, as well as major technology purchases and communication center installations. And finally, Mr. Thomas Moore, who is a senior associate with Fitch & Associates. He is the Director of Emergency Medical Services for the University Medical Center Health System in Lubbock, Texas. His professional healthcare experience includes designing, implementing, and managing ground ambulance services, managing hospital emergency care system and trauma centers, and providing consulting and leadership for strategic planning, mergers and acquisitions, as well as the development of RFPs. Um, so at this point in time, I'd now like to turn it over to Mr. Moore, who will walk us through the fundamentals of the RFP. And thank you for all being here in person today. Thank you. The board, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, we prepared a brief presentation to discuss the salient points of the development of the RFP process. Can you hear me now? All That's right. better. Thank you. Good. So briefly, give you just a little bit of background information about our organization. So we've been in business for 38 years, and during that time, we've been fortunate enough to do business in 50 states, uh, 10 Canadian provinces, and 12 other countries. Our experience includes designing, developing, uh, and managing some of the world's most innovative EMS systems. From a procurement perspective, our organization has been involved in more than 70 procurements for health systems, cities, and counties, including 12 in the state of California. So briefly, just to discuss the process design that went into this request for proposals document. First of all, we use a very deliberate, objective, and structured method in all of our requests for proposal and procurement processes. And as was mentioned previously, this one was specific and unique in the sense that we wanted to ensure that all the tenants of a successful request for proposal process would stay uh, at the core of the document and the process itself, while also allowing a public entity, a private entity, or a public-private collaboration or partnership to exist and then bid on the scope of services. So our goal is to clearly profile the system, its administrative procedures and other requirements, and then develop along with uh, feedback and input that we're able to solicit from the RFP AC committee, uh, stakeholders in the community, a final document. A developed RFP truly does allow the proposers to sharpen their pencils and propose ways that they can provide optimum value to the community while also mitigating risk. So the final RFP document uh, goes through a very iterative process. And many, many aspects within this specific document that we're discussing uh, were considered and discussed both from the aspect of the feedback that we were able to yield from the phase one and phase two studies that our firm conducted in 2018 and 2019, as well as uh, a stakeholder survey that was uh, provided last September, a draft comment period uh, of the draft document at that time in November of last year to any potential proposers. And that same document was also provided to the California EMS Authority. What's not listed here is that once the, the document itself is is uh, published and it's approved and we're in the, the, the midst of the process, a proposer's conference is a key tenant of the timeline itself. And during that session, it's essentially an all day, if not two day working session. Each page, each sentence and paragraph of the document are walked through with any potential proposers that have submitted a letter of intent so that we can codify any questions. We can get additional feedback from stakeholders and then if modifications need to be made or adjustments are needed, or if specific language or feature changes are identified, we can table uh, all of those elements, provide those answers and feedback to all of the potential proposers, uh, this body, and the public at large. So due to the uniqueness of this process, some specific considerations uh, had to be made with respect to certain historic say requirements uh, that are typically and have been for say decades, uh, ambulance procurement processes. 
And those are, uh, as you can see here, historical experience requirements, exclusive operating areas, response time standards, stop the clock agreements, bond and financial commitment thresholds, the scoring methodology, the treatment of the incumbent workforce, and then the system cost. And so the remaining uh, portion of this presentation, I'm going to highlight these key areas. The first being historical experience requirements. Typically, in a private ambulance procurement process, there would be historic experience requirements to ensure that the potential proposers that were coming to the table with a bid would be able to demonstrate their experience in a similar arena. And those requirements have uh, ranged from having transport apparatus experience uh, to a specific number of uh, transports. That could be 20,000 or 30,000, depending on the size of the locale. Uh, it could be that you have a demonstrated history of meeting response time uh, standards with a transport capable ap apparatus in a service area of a similar size. And the reason for that is that you, we you know, want to ensure that the individuals that are bringing a bid to the table have demonstrable experience in those areas. One of the public equivalencies that was uh, modified and adjusted into this RFP is that if the proposer did not have experience in one of those areas that historically they would have had to demonstrate experience for, uh, it reads, if you do not have experience, propose how you would meet this service provision. How would you meet the scope of work as, as it's written? And without modification, that traditional requirement would have eliminated any sort of public bidder. We'll briefly talk about the service area. So this is a uh, service area map of the current service area as it exists today. And there were four key areas that were considered by the RFP advisory committee. Option one was to bid the ESA, the exclusive operating uh, service area under the current configuration. Uh, option two is to bid each ESA separately. Option three was to combine all of ESA one and ESA two. And then option four was bid a single ESA. Uh, in December of 2021, the uh, LIMSA and the RFP Advisory Committee uh, convened based on feedback that was yielded from uh, some of the uh, potential proposer comment period that took place in November, as well as just concerns that were uh, mentioned in general due to the nuances that exist in some of the ESA areas that we have in this county. And a letter was provided to the California EMS Authority seeking clarification uh, regarding exclusive operating area boundaries. Uh, Cal Limsa responded back and essentially opined that based on the information that was presented, UCSB was not exclusive. And so that was taken back to the committee. Uh, and after significant discussion over the course of a, a few meetings, it was determined that the final, at least draft document would be finalized using option four, which is combining all of the ESAs into a single ESA. Response time standards. Uh, so the intent here is to maintain an effective ambulance response time and create a neutral competitive bidding process. Uh, the response time standards, and as you'll see in here in a moment as we talk about the stop the clock agreements, ex essentially exist somewhat in unison in the sense that we wanted to ensure that there were no, say, private slash public bidder implications if we were to they wholly modify or change those, those structures as they exist today in this current RFP. And so our goal was to codify the ambulance response time, uh, which is you know, 959, 90% of the time in urban areas, and where the fire service arrived and, quote, stop the clock, it was 759. Uh, due to public bidder implications with stop the clock funding, the recommendation was to essentially codify and maintain the effective ambulance response time as it exists today. Uh, with a threshold of 959. In addition, uh, a few additional changes that were made. Uh, the categories that are in the current agreement are um, different in nomenclature, whereas we use the US census definitions to define those polygons and those boundaries. For the stop the clock agreement aspect, uh, the consideration that was given to this specific area specifically deals with the potential financial benefit that an ambulance provider, let's say if it were a public entity, would have if indeed they were to, say, carve out or submit lower cost for work that's already being done by those organizations. And so the policy considerations that were discussed with the RFPAC included the perception that a private entity would have what 
ostensibly would be real cost uh, or actual cost, and a public entity could elect, and I say could because it's, you know, we don't know, uh, not to pay themselves to stop the clock for the first response agreement aspect that's currently existing today. And so a number of, uh, of different options and solutions and considerations were, were tossed about, and that's still going to be kind of an ongoing conversation. Uh, next, the bond and financial commitment threshold. So in typical ambulance procurements, it's uh, a key tenant is to have a performance security. And that gives the municipality assets to cash and assets in the event of some sort of a default, uh, which is historically or would have been by a private provider. We understood and consideration was given and much discussion was had amongst the committee that typically governments are reticent to designate dollars for either things that are not operating expenses, such as salaries and benefits, or capital outlay that would be vehicle and equipment. And so a public equivalency that was developed uh, was to allow government proposers to pledge receivables and assets in lieu of a performance security. And that could be uh, a set aside in a restricted fund that adheres to generally accepted accounting principles where dollars are allocated and then simply reappropriated or roll over year over year. And this was to ensure once more that there was inclusivity and that there was no intent to exclude any potential provider type or model. The next aspect uh, that uh, we want to touch on is the treatment of the incumbent workforce. So this is a, uh, this is a historical tenant and it's, it's really geared towards removing or eliminating the potential for draconian measures that existed say decades ago where a provider could uh, say exile or um, terminate or remove staff that were say more tenured or higher paid and then submit a lower cost of services for the service provision or the scope of work as it existed in the RFP. The specific language that you see here is that the winning proposer will be encouraged to recruit from and preferentially hire the incumbent paramedic and EMT workforce. The second paragraph has a, has a statement that says all incumbent personnel hired will retain seniority status. We wanted to clarify and ensure that the point was made, our intent was not to have any specific referential language in the document that potentially violated any sort of collective bargaining agreements or uh, other laws, state, local, federal, et cetera. Um, it's essentially to ensure that those draconian measures that have uh, existed in, in days past were not a part uh, of this RFP process. And then the other note uh, to this specific point is that it's not an associated scoring value. It's not a criterion that has uh, a score assigned. It's more so a uh, specific uh, element within the RFP itself. And then lastly here, the scoring methodology. Uh, so there's been much discussion about the scoring methodology. The state requires that the minimum qualifications be on a pass-fail basis. And obviously there are the four elements that uh, minimum qualifications must be established. And those are experience in managing a clinically sophisticated emergency ambulance service, uh, response time, performance, financial depth and stability, and then regulatory compliance. In addition to those minimum qualifications, there are clinical, operational, and administrative criterion uh, within those specific categories that are assigned an integer value and then scored based on a good, exceptional, uh, acceptable, or unsatisfactory basis, as you can see in the table uh, example here. And really the goal here is to make it a very transparent process to highlight the areas that we want to uh, have the potential proposers or the proposers once they've decided to submit a letter and bid, um, go through the process of asking themselves and pontificating how they would meet the specific criteria that exist. Uh, there's a sample document that's provided in the appendix. Um, I say sample because in tr that's in essence what it is. It's there to give the proposers something to pontificate as they work to develop specific answers and responses to those criterion as they exist and are written in the RFP. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Daniel Thank you, Thomas. Um, before we uh, go through the timeline, uh, I believe Dr. Shepard has additional comments on the RFP. I just want to make a quick comment from the uh, 
Good morning, Chairman, members of the board. I just want to make a quick comment from the LEMSA perspective. Uh, I appreciate the time. I think um, you know, when I'm in the emergency department seeing patients, uh, we see all comers. So it could be criminals, people who are physically, verbally threatening. Um, and we set that aside and treat them as individuals. And, and I would never compromise my integrity or, or you know, uh, my, my um, reputation to participate in a process that isn't you know, fair and, and, and thorough. And I know that goes for everyone in my office. Yes, some worked for, for AMR. I was the medical director for County Fire in the Carpinteria Fire, uh, Summerlin Fire Protection District. I trained in a system that has a fire-based transport system. Um, but we have a singular focus in the LEMSA, and that's to create a system that creates clinical parity across the county and gives the best care possible uh, to the patients, and that's really what we're what we're focused on. Um, I think a thorough, deliberate, careful approach um, shouldn't be misconstrued, misconstrued as, as bias or favoritism. Um, at the end of the day, when it comes to the RFP, um, our goal is really not who is providing the service, but how well they're doing it. I think that's really what we're concerned with, and we, we take the direction from the board and the public health department and, and the constraints or the boundaries provided by the statute and the regulations to every day, you know, to advance our EMS system, and we want innovation and clinical excellence. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. Um, and now, Nick, if you can walk us through the uh, timeline. Absolutely. So uh, should your board approve the RFP for release today, um, the timeline for um, the RFP intent to award would occur in uh, mid-September with a presentation of a contract before Thanksgiving and about a 15 to 17 month ramp up time. Next slide. Should um, there be um, the need for additional, uh, should your board have recommendations, changes uh, to the RFP staff may need time to review um, any potential impacts to the recommended changes um, and suggest returning to your board uh, on June 28th to present a, a hopefully final RFP um, prior to sending the RFP to the state for uh, review and approval. This would mean the intent to award would likely occur in early December with a final contract presented to your board uh, in uh, hope is estimated time in February. Um, that would then allow for a um, approximately 11 to 13 month um, ramp up time uh, should we maintain this uh, estimated timeline. That concludes our presentations and both uh, Fitch and Associates team as well as the county team, we're available for your questions. Thank you. Um, so it's back to the board and the first thing I wanna ask is whether there were any additional ex parte communications to report since our last meeting. Uh, Supervisor Nelson. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I, um last week met with the uh, LIMSA staff um, for the first time on this issue. I have nothing to report since last meeting. Uh, and I, I did meet with the LIMSA staff and, and with um, our consultants, uh, Steve Knight, Thomas Moore, and Guillermo Fuentes. And uh, I did speak briefly to the Fire Chief Hartwig at, uh, at a press conference, but very few remarks. Um, Supervisor Hart. Uh, last Friday, I <clears throat> met or spoke by telephone with um, Elizabeth Barnett, who's the ex executive director of the California EMS Authority, to talk about the timeline that they would uh, require to review our RFP. And she was very encouraging and said that, that her staff uh, was well aware of our RFP and would be assigning the, the appropriate staff as soon as they received it to turn around that document very quickly. Great, thank you. Supervisor Williams. Well, I also met with our consultants last Friday and our, um, our staff uh, earlier in the week on Wednesday um, and uh, did uh, exchange text messages with uh, Kevin Taylor and one phone call with Mr. Taylor uh, clarifying um, the points that they have made in their letter about uh, different uh, 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 elements of the RFP. So um, we're going to open it up for board questions, but before we do that. Mr. Hartman? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot. There was two other additional contacts that I had. I also met with Fitch and Associates on Friday, and I did um, 
meet with Molly Culver, um, who is a consultant for uh, AMR. Thank you. Um, so before we um, just open it up to board questions, I thought it might be helpful to structure our conversation by listing issues that we think are important ones. And uh, staff is prepared to actually write it down. And some of these issues were already covered, at least briefly, in the presentation. Um, but the, the first one I have is uh, exclusive operating areas and the status of UCSB. Um, the second I have is response time and stop the clock. Those work together. Um, the next, uh, financial security and bonds, um, that was listed. I'm not sure if we have any more questions about that or not. The fifth, the incumbent workforce. Um, the sixth, scoring methodology. And um, so we'll get those, I think, so they're up uh, and we can see them. And, uh, and what I thought is that if board members have additional ones to add, uh, we could do that as we go along. Or, uh, and then if the public has additional ones that, that they want to add or want to frame their remarks in light of those, uh, that makes it easier for us to assimilate what the information is. So, uh, Ms. Masnisic, will, will we be able to get uh, a screen with those listed? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, we have a member of staff taking notes, and I believe we're going to work to get it on this screen so that we can take down comments as they come. Perfect. Can I just add one that's yes. really significant just from the onset is that the, you know, I believe the language that um, reiterates the, the board's full discretion um, to accept one or deny both or any 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 number of parts uh, actions that could take place after uh, the RFP returns. Supervisor um, Nelson. Yeah, um, two additional ones. I, I, I may have been covered on what you were thinking, Chair Hartman, but a scoring um, criteria. I think there's something that's that I want to discuss as far as um, something that might not be on there that I think that should be integrated into the RFP as well as the, uh, the review panel. I, I think that's a big part of the discussion. Okay, the review panel. Uh, I also, um, the community public education programs and the fleet requirements, those are additional ones. Okay, so um, do we have any questions now about the RFP or about the presentation or about the context within which we're operating? Supervisor Lavanino. Thank you. I just want to make sure I'm getting this right. So we're going to post all these. We're going to hear public comment. Then we're going to come back and discuss each one as we go through. Okay, that makes sense. And I'm, I'm sort of eager to see our list up there of issues just so we can be sure whether it embraces everything that we uh, have in mind or as we hear things we may want to add to it. So, Madam Chair, what I have thus far is the EOA and the status of UCSB specifically, response time and stop the clock, financial security and bonds, incumbent workforce, scoring criteria, review panel, I'm letting Vaughn catch up with me, community education and outreach, fleet requirements, and then board authority discretion. Sure, I think I got it. That, that is my list, um, but will we have it up to look at it soon? We're working on it. Okay, all right. Well, I, uh, Supervisor Hart. Yeah, I also would like to um, have a staff work, doesn't need to be immediate, but a, a new timeline with the dates that, you know, would reflect today's action, changes to the RFP going through the EMSA uh, process. So we'd understand where, how this, the timeline that we have on slide 19 changes. All right. Supervisor Nelson, did you have anything additionally? Okay. So uh, I don't see any more lights up here for questions of staff on the presentation. 
So I guess we're ready. Uh, Madam Clerk, how many uh, public speakers do we have? Chair Hartman and members of the board, we currently have 20 requests to speak on this item. Okay, let's get started. And three minutes each. If you can make it, if, if it's repetitive, we would encourage you strongly to um, shorten it. Oh, yes. And at this point, I close public comment, so no additional speakers. Chair Hartman and members of the board, we are going to begin on Zoom with Philip Petit to be followed by Shelley Hendelson back here in Santa Barbara. Philip? Good morning, my name is Phil Petit and I'm National Director of the International Association of EMTs and Paramedics. And we proudly represent EMS professionals all around the state of California, including those in Local 70 employed by American Medical Response in Santa Barbara. As a proud partner with AMR in Santa Barbara County for over a decade, we've cooperated to improve the working lives of these first responders and to ensure your constituents receive the best emergency care possible. Today, I am here to speak in favor of the incumbent workforce language, including the RFP. I know in recent extensive remarks by fire department representatives, the applause worthy uh, protections for incumbent employees uh, were derided as a barrier to success. On the contrary, these protections are critical to the stability of Santa Barbara's emergency services system, a committed, cohesive and experienced workforce with intimate knowledge of the area and the patients they serve is an invaluable resource worth of years of careful cultivation. So thank you very much for your time and I urge you to support uh, the inclusion of that incumbent workforce language. We will now return to Santa Barbara with Shelley Hendelson to be followed by Heather Vander Linden. Shelley. Good afternoon. My name is Shelley Huddleston and I represent the EMS professionals for the IAEP Local 70 employed by American Medical Response in Santa Barbara. As it has come to our attention, the Board of County Commissioners in Santa Barbara is entertaining the possibility of opening an EMS provider RFP. While we recognize it is their right to do so, having built a productive and cooperative relationship with AMR in this region, we believe the right provider already has the job. As many are aware, there is a crisis of personnel in the EMS industry today. In addition to a severe lack of available labor in EMS, pay rates are on the rise and are causing many units to operate at limited capacity. Together with AMR, we have built a resilient community of professional first responders who take pride in their work, support one another, and fight for the same cause. Uprooting the effective system only to face a costly, difficult, and potentially disastrous workforce rebuilding period is simply untenable. Both for the constituents of Santa Barbara who will be at risk and for the workers who have given their years of their lives for this county. To that end, I wish to thank the Board of County Commissioner Commissioners for including employee protection language in their drafted RFP. Limiting collateral damage must be a critical priority if Santa Barbara feels the change in EMS providers is ultimately warranted. Collateral damage here not only refers to the families who would undoubtedly be jeopardized by a complete workforce turnover, but the steep loss in quality of care that will follow. The EMS professionals who serve Santa Barbara have risked and already lost must much to protect their community. Rewarding them with a kick in the teeth for that commitment is simply unacceptable. The current workforce must be protected. Thank you. We will now go to Heather Vanderlinden to be followed by Dave, excuse me, Dave Schultzman. Heather? Good afternoon, board. My name is Heather and I have served this county for the past eight years as an EMT field training officer and paramedic, now secretary for the IAP Local 70. I was born and raised in this community which has given me courage today to stand up and speak as well as my passion for this job. I am normally a very poor public speaker, but today I am without hesitation because of my fear, frustration, and lessons I have learned from the stress related to this RFP, both in these courtrooms, Zoom meetings, and unfortunately on 911 calls as well. 
My coworkers and I can tell you tension from fire extend beyond this room and affect patient care as well as the community's view of us. This can be backed with incident reports that have been presented to you, the EMSA, as well throughout this process, as well as letters from the hospital with disagreement about fire possibly taking over EMS in this county, along with apparent lack of AMR and press releases by their PEO, PIO. Like I stated, 911 scenes are no exception. It was only over this past weekend I was contacted by a Santa Barbara County Sheriff officer who recognized this animosity in the middle of a cardiac arrest with family presence, which delayed proper treatment and transport times. I would like to make the board aware that this type of behavior has gotten worse since this process began and has occurred to all of us. First responders are viewed as a team who work together for a benefit of those they serve. Why has this value not been present and agendas are being placed before care? And I hope this question resonates with all providers present here today and listening. But this community will not see this, only we do. As a community member and provider, it is my job to be an advocate. It is sickening that this negativity from this extend beyond these meetings or these walls of this courtroom and has been affecting the care this community receives. Fire has submitted a lot of claims wanting to better this community and provide better medical care, but are failing to do so during a process where they should be setting a higher example. To the board, I encourage you to be advocates both financially and care-wise for this community and see that the EMTs and paramedics of IEP Local 70 have been continuing to serve with high levels of care and manage scenes in professional manners throughout this process. To Santa Barbara County Fire, I respect you for what you do and for continuing to train in the always advancing medical world as well as the fireside too. That is a difficult feat. But understand that we have a, a focus versus many, which is shown when comparing care and today we are talking about what is best for the emergency medical service choice for this community. Finally, to my fellow coworkers, I applaud you for continuing to have passion and striving to improve yourselves as healthcare professionals during this time. You have remained steadfast in advocating for the people we care for, and I am proud to work along every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go to Dave Schultzman to be followed by Mary Guther. Dave? Madam Chair, distinguished members of the board. My name is Dave Shireman. I am the Director of Operations for AMR here in Santa Barbara County. I moved to this county and started working with AMR 33 years ago and was promoted to management just in time to be involved in the previous ambulance contract negotiations. The circumstances back then are almost identical to what we're experiencing now. Lots of posturing over who could do what and who was best for the job. I believe then and I still believe now that staying with AMR was the right decision a decision that has made Santa Barbara County EMS system one of the highest functioning in the nation. Where your chances of surviving a cardiac arrest is significantly higher, where your chance for early intervention for a major heart attack or stroke is higher, and where you receive the fastest response to your 911 calls regardless of where you are or your ability to pay. You have heard from other agencies who are competing for this contract, making promises of what they will do if given the contract. Most if, most, most, if not all of these things promised, do not require an ambulance to accomplish and could have been done a long time ago. Rather than give you promise of what we will do, I'd like to tell you what we did do. Over the life of the contract, AMR has paid $54 million into the local EMS system, including close to $20 million to the fire departments. Over the life of the contract, AMR has provided a countywide borderless response where all units are tracked in real time and the closest unit is sent to the call. Over the life of this contract, AMR has had partnerships with all local colleges to provide no cost field training to their EMT students. Over the life of this contract, AMR has had the only in county fully accredited paramedic training program where we provide full ride scholarships to our EMTs to further their careers in EMS. AMR has remained on the cutting edge of technology with a modern fleet state-of-the-art equipment, and clinical sophistication that's second to none. AMR's robust pre-COVID con contingency planning ensured critical PPE to our teams throughout the pandemic with no reliance or impact on scarce local resources. AMR has never said no to, the, to a request by the EMS agency and has led the way in every pilot program or study. AMR has been entirely transparent with all aspects of our operation our CAD data is published to PulsePoint app where anyone in the world can see where we're going and where we've been. 
We provide detailed annual financials that are audited by a third-party firm and vetted by the Public Health Department's finance team. From vehicle mileage and maintenance records to deployment plans to staff certifications, AMR provides far more transparency to our regulators than most agencies even track. While we typically have excellent relations with our fire colleagues, that is not always the case in the times of contract renewals. The recent passion they show for EMS is temporary. Like in 2004, that passion was not here prior to the contract talks, and that passion will not be here after the talks are concluded. And that is your time. We will now go to Mary uh, Guther to be followed by Corey Davis. Mary? My apologies if I mispronounced your last name. Good morning, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Board. My name is Mary Gothier, and I've been a paramedic for American Medical Response for 34 years, proudly serving you and our Santa Barbara County. First, I would like to tell you how I educate all my patients and anyone that asks when I'm transporting if I'm involved or part of the fire department system. This is what I say. I actually work for American Medical Response, which is a private company contracted by the County of Santa Barbara. We are your paramedic and ambulance provider for Santa Barbara County and have proudly serviced your area for over 50 years. Yes, some of our fire departments have paramedics on the fire engines and they respond to calls. However, when we get on scene, we are the ones that most of the time continue that patient care and transport to the hospital. We respond to all 911 calls and do interfacility transports. I know we're in a unique and historical time right now in regards to negotiating our ambulance contract. I've had my own thinking, my maybes, my what ifs. I have great relationships with my allied agencies and I'm proud to work with everyone here in this room. But what I keep coming back to is this. AMR does medicine very well. We are invested in this community as a private ambulance company. We, <clears throat> what, <laughs> excuse me. Um, fire does fire very well, as they should, and all the elements that go with it. But this is our focus, is medicine. We do paramedic service in this county very well, and there's no one here that will dispute that. We've discussed that in past Board of Supervisor meetings. We have great equipment, we have great ambulances, we train, we have great personnel that keep up with all the training that is needed to run a paramedic system. Why would you want to change any of that? We have everything already established here and it runs really well. And I know we talk a lot about the money and then it goes to stockholders, but I respectfully disagree. A lot of that money comes back to us here in this area. It goes into our ambulances, our maintenance, our new ambulances that we get, equipment, medicine, the training, providing insurance for our personnel, uh, life insurance, medical insurance. Okay, it goes into paying for gas. It's very expensive, as you know, to run an ambulance company. We provide our own retirement to ourselves, and our company matches that. We don't ask the taxpayers for anything. It comes from within us. I wish I could believe, and I'm not sure I truly do, that if the service went over to the fire department that we would get all our money back into the EMS, but I hope that that would be the case. But I hope you choose AMR because we do provide the best service to this community. Thank you very much. We will now go to Corey Davis to be followed by Shane Rankin. Corey. Madam Chair on the board, uh, thank you for hearing me. My name is Corey Davis. I've been Medicare with AMR since 2006 and currently serve as the president of IAP Local 70, uh, representing your community, EMTs and paramedics. I'm also on the member of the executive board of the IAP National. So this, we've talked a lot about EMS um, nationally now. Uh, I am here today out of an abundance of concern about the future of EMS in this county and its current workforce. My fellow coworkers and I share a passion for EMS that has seen us through some tough and lean times. Through many trials, we have merged with one of the highest performing EMS systems in the country. 
we consistently rank among the top when it comes to cardiac arrest saves. Something to note about this is that for a long time, all of the data was provided by AMR as County Fire refused to participate in the national database. Uh, so much for 100% transparency there. The fact is that for some reason, they are fighting any clinical related requirements in the RFP, which I find very concerning. You have heard a lot from the fire departments about how they would implement all these wonderful programs for the community if they are simply and potentially illegally awarded the contract. My question is, why have they not implemented these things already? None of them require transport medics. It appears the bottom line is they only care about EMS when the contract is up for renewal. The remainder of the time, they have proven over the years to be more of a hindrance than a help. It is simply not possible to perform two jobs as efficiently as one. You do not want your plumber to be your doctor as well, I am assuming. Both EMS and fire have advanced to the point that trying to learn and perform both jobs well is nigh impossible. It's a matter of basic logic that medics who transport and are with the patients the vast majority of the time are going to be the superior medics. This is absolutely the case here. Fire-based EMS is an antiquated model which the rest of the industrialized world has figured out. Finally, FIRE has made it publicly clear that they do not want to retain the current workforce and wish to make all personnel decisions themselves, including compensation and benefits. It only takes a glance at the transparent California website to see the county can ill afford the bloated salaries that have already occurred, though these would continue to be reserved for real firefighters. I highly recommend the board refuse the shady legal advice given by fires council and avoid legal entanglements by seeing this process through. I also recommend you think carefully before dismantling a system that has served this community, community faithfully and professionally for over 50 years. Thank you for your time. We will now go to Shane Rankin to be followed by Ray Gayuk. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Shane Rankin. I'm a paramedic uh, with uh, AMR. Been serving the community for uh, since 2005, or correction, 2015. I'm here representing uh, the rest of my uh, coworkers and fellow paramedics and EMTs in this county under AMR and the local 70 of a eight e <laughs> excuse me of our union. Uh, just that, like our fellow coworkers have mentioned and board member have mentioned, the animosity between our profession and the and other professionals and agencies on scene with um, county fire is uh, the stress that has go on where we continue to provide excellent care to our customers and try to keep a good professionalism where we are being questioned about our protocols and um, our treatment and it puts stress on us as um, we continue to um, do our job and provide care and it doesn't help when we hear other agencies publicly saying that they're not going to hire us or take their out to get our jobs. <clears throat> I'm just here to represent and to um, continue to say that I'm against the county fire jobs and county going towards the transporting agency. I thank you for your time and have a good evening. We will now go to Ray. Uh, uh, excuse me, Ga'ayak, to be followed by Montecito Fire Chief Kevin Taylor. Madam Chair and distinguished members of the board, my name is Ray Geik. I am the uh, Fire Chief for the Ontario Fire Department and the President of the California Fire Chiefs Association. As the Cal Chiefs President, I've had the opportunity to speak with fire chiefs all over the state. One of the most common things I hear is, there are many private, for-profit ambulance companies failing to provide adequate and timely ambulance response. There are many reasons for the ambulance shortage today, the ambulance crisis today, and they aren't all linked to COVID. Numerous fire agencies have taken on this crisis by staffing fire-based ambulances under an emergency declaration to make sure our citizens get an ambulance if they need one. In fact, the city of Ontario did just that thing. The city uh, council directed me as the fire chief to get an ambulance, staff it every single day, because we couldn't simply trust our private provider to get to the calls on times. 
in our county and all around the state were waiting for ambulances 30, 40, even 60 minutes to critical calls. That's why we had to do what we had to do in my own city. There's a serious lack of private ambulances in the street today. Why don't we hear more about this? Why don't we hear more about this crisis? Because a vast majority of the time, the fire service shows up first, provides excellent service to the patient, and then the private provider arrives on scene later, oftentimes 20, 30, 40 minutes later. But the bottom line is, is that the public is not an outcry because the fire service is there providing that service. I wonder if the fire department didn't show up and your constituents waited 30, 40, 60 minutes for an ambulance, the first responder to get there. I wonder if you would hear about it then. The answer is sitting right in front of you. The fire agencies of Santa Barbara County are prepared to permanently fix the problem. Ambulances are a resource. Your fire agencies manage resources on some of the largest, most complex incidents in the world. Not just in your area, not just in the state, but in the world. And they do it every single year. If they did control this critical resource, would we, we would not have an ambulance shortage today up and down the state. On January 1st, 2022, AB 389 took effect. Santa Barbara County is the first county to consider an ambulance RFP since the new law took effect. The, the question for the County Board of Supervisors today, is Santa Barbara County interested in developing an innovative, patient-centered, cutting-edge EMS system that will meet the needs of the people of Santa Barbara County now and into the future? Or is Santa Barbara County going to settle for a failed EMS system that, is your that time. was designed in the 1970s and 80s, which is failing today? Thank you very much. We will now go to Montecito Fire Chief Kevin Taylor to be followed by Gregory Fesch. Kevin? Madam Chair and distinguished I, board members. Let me, oh, let me just, we're, we're squirming up here yeah. um, because uh, first it's very disheartening to hear that there's animosity in the field and, and some of this is coming up here. Everyone in this room is a professional. Everyone puts the needs of the patient first and you're much too, you have all of you too much integrity to take pot shots at each other here. So we, we just don't want to hear any more of it. Yeah, I was just going to say, whatever, whoever gave you guys the strategy this morning, don't listen to them. That's a really bad idea on both sides, and it's coming from both sides. I can guarantee you this is not the way we work, okay? This is the way politics used to be. The way that you think you're going to move up is by ripping the other person down. It's not, that is not going to work, and, it, and it, it's really a sad day for the public. I'm sitting here listening to this. I've never been more disappointed. A room full of people that are public servants that every time I've heard from both sides of you, it's about how we can help the community. I haven't heard one freaking person bring up that yet. It's ripping the other side. And honestly, I'm, at this point, I wouldn't want to give it to either one of you. You know, that's where I'm at right now. I'm not happy. Supervisor Hart. Well, the only thing I'd add is that... Um, what we're here actually doing is looking at the RFP. We're not awarding a contract today. We're not making a decision about who's going to provide the service. We're just creating a fair and level playing field for the competition to begin. So this is actually the talk before the game begins. And uh, probably should be, remarks should be focused on the RFP. And we will now go to Montecito Fire Chief Kevin Taylor to be followed by Gregory Fish. Thanks very much, Madam Chair and distinguished board members. I'm Kevin Taylor, Fire Chief for the Montecito Fire Department. Thank you for the opportunity to comment this morning and thank you for the good advice. The Santa Barbara County Fire Chiefs understands that you must adopt a resolution today to approve a contract extension with the incumbent provider to comply with AB 389. We recognize that you are required to do that today to move forward with the contract extension. That said, we would encourage you to start the process to update your ambulance ordinance at a meeting in the near future. 
By updating the current ordinance, you will ensure our ability to provide exceptional service to our communities. The ordinance will allow you to accomplish several things. Transparency to include response time and staffing levels, compliance, audited financials, an open, transparent public process for the bid through an ad hoc committee to ensure a fair and level playing field. Our, financial, our foundational position from the very beginning. We believe strongly that this should be open and in the public. Our proposed ordinance clearly defines the administrative authority of the Board of Supervisors and the medical control of the LEMSA. It has the Board of Supervisors review and approve the EMS plan, which is an annual state requirement. It also requires a complete review of our EMS system every five years to ensure that our community members continue to receive exceptional emergency care. Finally, as part of our proposal, we will rely upon a community advisory group to guide service. Facilitated by County Fire, the community advisory group consists of our important program stakeholders, first responder providers, labor representatives, educational institutions, hospitals and receiving facilities, mental health providers, and substance abuse providers. The purpose of the community advisory group is to inform our program's objectives, identify gaps in service in each of our communities, and to develop actionable methods to address each of these issues. Thank you. We will now go to Gregory Fish to be followed by Santa Barbara Fire Chief Chris Mails. Gregory? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, distinguished board members. I am Greg Fish. I currently serve as the president of the Santa Barbara County Fire Chiefs Association, and I am also the fire chief of the Carpentry of Summerlin Fire Protection District. So thank you for taking the time to hear from us today. The fire chiefs in Santa Barbara County make decisions that ultimately puts the communities we serve first, first and foremost. We understand the value of unity and collaboration, and we are aware that there are significant advantages by working together to solve complex emergencies and challenges within the jurisdictions we protect and serve. I wanna talk about the capabilities of our public service model. When a community member calls 911, a public safety answering point, PSAP, answers the call. That public provider or dispatcher determines the call type, dispatches our units, and provides critically important pre-arrival instructions. That call goes out to our public first responder units that respond from strategically located fire stations. Our firefighters and firefighter paramedics immediately respond and provide care to the rest of, to the, our community members. These units respond based on the closest, most appropriate resource model to ensure that our community members receive exceptional service regardless of what jurisdiction they live in. This represents our commitment to our communities, the commitment of our firefighters, and the commitment of our firefighter paramedics to providing exceptional and timely service. In our current system, the incumbent provider collects payment for the transport service to the hospital. The public provider answers the 911 call, provides timely first response service and exceptional care while the transport provider collects revenue for the ride to the hospital. Consider a system where the provider gives a ride to the hospital and where the public provider collects revenue for the transport. This would allow the public provider to reinvest revenue into our system for programs that our, current communities, that our communities don't currently enjoy. Programs like mental health and behavioral wellness focused responses and homeless outreach and the like. Our outstanding service delivery to the communities we serve is a hallmark of our reputation. Moreover, your fire departments are willing and able to deliver superior and appropriate emergency medical services long into the future. If given the opportunity to bid in an equitable, transparent and competitive process, we are confident we will be the successful bidder. Thank you very much. We will now go to Santa Barbara Fire Chief Chris Mails to be followed by the Santa Maria Fire Chief Todd Tuggle. Chris. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Chris Mails. I'm the city's fire chief. Uh, I wanted to talk to you. I'm very pleased to see that you have response times in the discussion. I wanted to pro provide a little bit more insight into the response time issue. The city of Santa Barbara is a basic life support agency. We rely solely on the private ambulance service to provide paramedics. The current contract allows for the ambulances to arrive in seven minutes and 59 seconds. 
the new contract would be nine minutes and 59 seconds. For minor emergencies, that response time requirement goes from 1459 to 1659. On its face, two minutes may seem trivial, but it's not. It's really not. It's going to require my fire units potentially to remain on scene for two additional minutes awaiting an ambulance, which would possibly impact service to my citizens. For minor calls, as an example, we might have a police unit waiting on scene for an ambulance to arrive, and that goes from 1459 to 1659, or 17 minutes. Most importantly, here's the nexus between response times and ambulance staffing. Relaxing response times directly equates to an ambulance provider being able to provide less ambulances on the street. Less ambulances on the street. The sole reason for increasing response times is to affect the bottom line. Studies show that an ambulance uh, provided 24-7, 365 is in excess of a million dollars. If the provider is allowed to re uh, relax the response times, we're potentially talking about four to five less ambulances available in the county of Santa Barbara. So I would urge the county, and I'm very pleased to see it, I would urge the county to really look at response times. Look at the impacts and the downstream impacts of response times. It's not just a simple two minute difference. There's downstream effects. As the fire chief for the city, I do have concerns about waiting 10 minutes, potentially for an ambulance to arrive. And it appears that really what we're doing is taking a step backwards by potentially deploying less ambulances on the street than what we currently enjoy in the current system. Thank you. We will now go to the Santa Maria Fire Chief Todd Tuggle to be followed by Shauna Jorgensen. Todd. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, distinguished board members. My name is Todd Tuggle. I'm the uh, Fire Chief for the City of Santa Maria. I want to first thank you for the course correction that you just gave us with regards to the professionals that are working day in and day out. And what I'm about to say, I want to make very clear, is not directed at our first responders in any way, shape, or form, but is directed specifically at the RFP uh, to your uh, comment, Chair Hart, or, uh, Supervisor Hart. Um, last, our fire department mission is to provide all an enhanced public safety through risk reduction, disaster preparedness, and emergency response of all types and kinds, including medical calls. Last year, we met our stated objectives for response time to medical responses over 7,000 times in the city of Santa Maria to support our community. During those responses, we arrived, we initiated care, we worked with our paramedic partners uh, from the emergency scene all the way through the transport to the hospital. It is an integrated level of care that the fire service is an important component of. And I'll give you an example, um, or I'll, I'll like explain that through an example that I had last Friday, driving back to headquarters, I came across an accident on the freeway, a motorcycle down on the freeway. And what I watched was I watched three firefighters from the city of Santa Maria arrive on scene with two AMR personnel, firefighters, secured the scene by blocking traffic with their fire engine. They assessed the patient with CHP. They worked with our uh, AMR partners. They packaged the patient, lifted the patient, took the patient to the ambulance, and then assisted AMR personnel as a team to the hospital. And there they gave the best care possible. At, uh, it was delivered at Marion Hospital in the emergency department. So it is beyond question that the fire department is an integral component of the medical system as a whole. This RFP endangers that support. This RFP puts that at risk from the city. And it violates three fundamental components of our service model. It increases the response times of the ambulances. You just heard about that from Chief Mails. It increases the time in the city of Santa Maria where we have BLS agency for the arrival of paramedics on scene. And it also eliminates the material support through the first responder fees to offset the cost of supplies and equipment for the city of Santa Maria, which is encumbered through the city budget. At the core, this RFP increases our commit times 20 to 25%. And this is an unacceptable financial obligation that we're gonna bear. Additionally, paramedics are delayed by two minutes, reducing service levels and impacting the health and well-being of my community, the community I serve. 
And lastly, Santa Maria is expected to support AMR as mentioned above without the first responder fees that are instrumental to the purchase of EMS supplies and equipment over the course uh, to support our mission. And over the course of the 10-year contract, these fees will equate to approximately $2 million in lost revenue and a shifted burden to the budget for the city of Santa Maria. Thank you for your time. We will now go to Shauna Jorgensen to be followed by Andrew Scouten. Shauna. Thank you. Honorable Chair Hartman and members of the board, my name is Shauna Jorgensen. I am the Deputy Director and CFO for the Santa Barbara County Fire Department. In preparation for the release of the county's ambulance transport contract, the fire department has invested a tremendous amount of resources in the evaluation of our potential bid. Mm -hmm. Throughout 2019 and 2020, we focused our efforts on deployment modeling and financial forecasting. Subsequent to this, we hired a forensic CPA to stress test the financial and deployment assumptions. Furthermore, we presented the financial and deployment modeling to our CEO analysts for further stress testing. Over the past year, we have had a team dedicated to the development of our business plan and all associated operational policies and procedures. On multiple occasions, our team has met with the Contra Costa Director of Administration and Finance, as well as operational staff, to better understand how the County of Contra Costa has managed the EMS transport funds. The County of Contra Costa elected to not set up an enterprise fund rather established a separate fund within the fire department. This decision was made after consultation with their county executive staff and the office of the auditor controller. Contra Costa leadership required the fire department to establish a six month operating reserve. The Contra Costa fire department was able to meet this target within the first 18 months of operations. Since 2016, they have been able to set aside approximately $45 million in reserves. The value of this healthy reserve fund resulted in transport service level enhancements for the residents of Contra Costa County. Some of these include enhancements to their first response services and their surge capability for the underserved communi communities of Contra Costa. They also hired additional ambulance providers to handle the surge during COVID-19. They also were able to expand their dispatch service with seven additional full-time dispatchers and since 2021, they have begun to acquire fully outfitted ambulance fleet, which includes all the gurneys, cardi cardiac monitors, and everything needed to equip those ambulances. The most exciting part that I'd like to point out is they are not stopping there, and they are continuously evaluating how they can improve the services they provide to their community. The fire department is invested in the process not to meet financial targets, but to utilize the revenue as a tool to enhance and expand the county's ambulance transport service for our beautiful communities and our visitors. Thank you. We will now go to Andrew Scouten to be followed by the Santa Barbara County Fire Chief, Mark Hart Hartwig. Andrew. Good afternoon, Chair Hartman, distinguished supervisors. It's good to be back here after three weeks. Um, as you know, I am an attorney who represents the California Fire Chiefs Association, as well as the County Fire Chiefs Association. And my practice focuses on antitrust and unfair competition law, as well as EMS and ambulance law. Um, I'm here today to respond primarily to the uh, LEMSA presentation that was not provided before our comments were due, as well as to touch on competition issues related to the RFP. First one I wanna talk about is response time standards. Now this presentation that was just up says that the move from seven minutes and 59 seconds to nine minutes and 59 seconds is necessary to ensure a level playing field uh, due to, quote, public bitter implications, unquote. Uh, that seems to mean that county fire somehow wouldn't have to, wouldn't be paying itself to provide the stop the clock first responder services. In other words, because it would be more efficient and cost effective for county fire to respond at seven minutes and 59 seconds than it would for a private provider, the LEMSA decided to lower the response time standards in the RFP. This is favoritism. 
and it sacrifices, patient, it sacrifices patient care to keep the incumbent in the game. Let's talk about the scoring methodology. Um, uh, I believe it was one of the consultants who said that the state requires minimum qualifications on a pass-fail basis. Uh, I've been practicing in this area for six to, I guess maybe seven years now. I've successfully sued state EMSA twice for using invalid and unlawful rules and regulations. And I can tell you, I have never seen this anywhere. The idea that the state requires minimum qualifications to be on a pass-fail basis, never seen it. Moreover, it's actually contrary to binding case law. I've cited a number of cases in both of the letters to the board um, discussing how you, it's not proper to analyze minimum qualifications on a pass-fail basis. <clears throat> now let's talk about the bonds and financial thresholds. Uh, according to the presentation, um, a public agency could pledge receivables and assets in lieu of bonds. That's correct. But the RFP also requires them to operate in an enterprise fund. Um, and supposedly that's to make up for the difference between public and private entities because a private entity has to put up performance security. But an enterprise fund isn't a performance bond, nor does the RFP put the similar kinds of restrictions on private bidders than it does on a public agency in terms of its accounting, finances, and what to remit to a parent uh, agency or entity. Um, I see that my time is up, and so I thank you very much for the opportunity. Happy to answer any questions if you have any. We will now go to Fire Chief Mark Hartwig to be followed by Kurt Hankey. Mark? Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Mark Hartwig and I'm your Fire Chief. I'd like to build on the capability of the operational area, more specifically the County Fire Department. The County Fire Department began services to the people of Santa Barbara County in 1926. We have continued to increase and diversify our services based on the needs and requests from the communities we serve through 911. We have been providing advanced first aid and resuscitation from fire engines and ambulances starting in the 1950s. We and our op area partners cross-trained our firefighters and rescue personnel to be emergency medical technicians and paramedics in an effort to better address the calls for service from our communities. Today, we provide advanced life support paramedic services from our 16 stations spread across the county. We provide service based on the need within our respective communities without regard to the profitability. The County Fire Department currently provides ambulance service in areas of the county that are in need of service. Kuyama starting in 1973, Vandenberg Village and Mission Hills in 1982, and UCSB in 2011. We support the compensation of first responders for the work they do on scene and the ambulance response time requirement at eight minutes instead of the increase at 10 minutes. We support these provisions because these provisions provide for the right types and levels of services to the residents of the county. And more importantly, or as importantly, we believe that there's available revenue to maintain these requirements within the roughly $75 million exclusive annual contract. This is what we know about why response times and early inter intervention makes a difference in survivability and quality of life. Trauma centers were developed and, positions in each, and positioned in each county in order to meet the golden hour, now referred to the platinum half hour, where intervention by a trauma surgeon to find and stop internal bleeding is often the difference between life and death. Expedited transport is paramount. STEMI or heart attack centers were created to reduce the time between the episode and the time to balloon. Today we identify heart, heart attacks in the field and Heart centers activate cardiac catheterization labs so that patients meeting appropriate criteria pass right through the emergency room to the cardiac cath lab. Transports are expedited in order to minimize the time between cardiac injury and coronary artery catheterization that restores blood flow to the heart. Stroke centers are fairly recent innovations in which certain hospitals throughout the state and here in this county are equipped to deliver thrombolytics or clot busters to stroke patients identified in the field and then transported rapidly to these centers. Early intervention and rapid transport are foundational to a high performing and effective emergency medical services system. This operational area and your county fire department has demonstrated its ability to meet the needs of the county residents over many years and throughout our most challenging times. We look forward to continue that commitment as you contemplate much needed improvements and innovation in the County of Santa Barbara. Thank you. 
We will now go to Kurt Hankey to be followed by Mike Sanders. Kurt. Well, good afternoon, Chair Hartman, honorable board members. My name is Kurt Hankey. I'm the principal in AP Triton. And actually, I was the principal that uh, ran the Contra Costa RFP, which was a successful partnership between the fire district and AMR. So I say to the AMR brothers and sisters, clearly uh, they are super valuable and they're a necessary component in a system. And so I think that's important to, to elevate that status up and to offer comfort because in a competing interest, people worry about whether they're gonna have a job, whether they're gonna be able to feed their family, et cetera. And I can tell you, having worked with uh, the fire chiefs in Santa Barbara and with the California fire chiefs, they most certainly are going to be able to enjoy that no matter who wins the bid because it's the right thing to do. Um, I would just say this, it's about a level and fair playing field. It's about transparency. And I think that when you look across the state of California, we work for some large agencies, City of San Diego, we've been brought in, Contra Costa County. I can go on and on and on. At the end of the day, it's about a fair and transparent process. And I think when we look at contracts, that in some cases in this county could be 40, $50 million uh, a year, and you start to look over a 10-year period, in Contra Costa County, it was a half a billion dollar contract. That's a policy decision of the Board of Supervisors. And I would urge you that you need to take a look at that when you're looking at dollars of that amount and really take that into consideration that that's your decision. You're the elected body. And so at the end of the day, I think the trust really has to be in the elected officials because the public's the one that puts you there. Not us mid-level bureaucrats, and I point to myself, I retired as a fire chief many years ago, but in the elected members of the board. I think that's important. It, as we close in on this, the RFP really does have issues in it that are biased against the public sector. And I don't think that was intentional from Fitch's component, but I think that it, it got in there. And I think it's due to a lack of understanding of exactly how the public sector works. We heard today, this is the first one of its kind from Fitch. Uh, and in essence, it sort of is beyond the Contra Costa model. This really is the first one that they're taking a crack at where you're trying to sit there and balance those out. But at the end of the day, the public sector has a couple things that the private sector, and I'm not talking about the employees, I'm talking about the corporations. We have to be transparent. We have to sunshine our finances. We don't get to claim proprietary uh, ownership. We answer to the public. We answer to you, and we just urge that we have a fair and level playing field moving forward, and we would highly encourage you, the board of directors, to be the deciders and the decision makers. Thank you very much for your time. We will now go to Mike Sanders to be followed by Mark Ingalls. Mike? Madam Chair and distinguished members of the board, my name is Mike Sanders and I am the Regional Director for American Medical Response in Santa Barbara County. First off, I'd like to take a moment to thank you by allowing us the privilege to serve the citizens of Santa Barbara for the past 50 years. AMR has been a steadfast partner to the county and we look forward to continuing our relationship in the coming years. In addition to being a paramedic for over 25 years, I have been part of the, um, the AMR disaster response team in support of our national FEMA contract. In that role, I have traveled throughout the nation and have worked alongside many different EMS systems, both public and private. I can tell you without reservation, Santa Barbara has one of the very best EMS systems in the country, something you all should be very proud of. The backbone of this EMS system, which includes 100% on-scene time compliance during the span of the 15-year contract, are the experienced paramedics and EMTs, support staff and management team, who live and serve in this county. AMR understands this and is committed to this workforce just as they are committed to the community. We've recently invested in them by giving them significant wage increase while facing the unknown future of an RFP. We want them to know we're here for them and that we support them. With that said, several of our employees have indicated they do, they do not want to work for the fire department. Furthermore, the county chief stated they would be extremely limited to hiring the incumbent workforce. 
This is a tremendous risk the county is taking, potentially losing many highly qualified personnel. AMR paramedics and EMTs are healthcare professionals who are with a patient from the moment they are on scene to the moment they clear the hospital. They have risked the unknown of entering a patient's home with COVID at the beginning of this pan pandemic. They developed and staffed an infectious response team when Ebola was a concern a number of years ago. They have trained thousands of citizens in the county on hands-only CPR throughout the life of this contract. They developed a mental health assessment team, which was staffed by paramedics that provided crisis response in the field to, to assess the mentally ill. These examples, are not, these examples are only touching the surface of what it is we already provide to the community and goes to show that it is more simply more than simply ambulance transport. These men and women are already the community paramedics. I'd like to close my comments by saying on May 10th, you made it clear that we were unable to move forward with an RFP without an extension of the EMS contract with AMR. Through the good working relationship we have with the county EMS agency, we have been able to discuss our concerns in an open manner and agreed to an extension that we feel benefits the county and protects both AMR's workforce and the company. To be clear, we're not going anywhere. We plan to be here and we will continue our great service to this county. Thank you, and we're available for any questions. We will now go to Mark Ingalls to be followed by Brian Fernandez. Mark? Good afternoon, Chair. Hartman and members of the board, my name is Mark Ingalls. I'm a resident of Santa Barbara and a third generation from our beautiful community. I'm here today before you to support a fair and unbiased RFP process for the county's ambulance contract. Santa Barbara County has been under contract with AMR for an exclusive ambulance service for 30 years. The competitive bid process should help enable and ensure Santa Barbara County mm -hmm. residents are receiving the best and most comprehensive service for the best possible price for our residents. First, let me state that I don't have a gripe with AMR. I only want the best possible emergency service for our county. When it comes to 911 emergency services, we should be looking at every feasible way to integrate technology best practices while increasing the service levels in our county. Any public contract that lasts for 30 years without competitive bidding should be called to question. It is your job as elected officials to make sure that the departments that you oversee create an opportunity and a platform to attract the best and most qualified candidates in the RFP and competitive bid process. The expectation for the RFP process should not be to settle for status quo or baseline service levels, but should instead identify and reward the best and highest value service proposals. In order for the RFP process to be fair and yield the best result, it cannot favor or advantage the current service provider. Each pr proposal should be evaluated and rewarded on its substance and merits. The board directed the EMS staff to put the ambulance contract out to bid nearly four years ago. Granted, two of the last four years have been a bit overshadowed by the pandemic, but this should not be an excuse or a delay for this important emergency service contract. Anyone following the process should have questions, should have to question the delay and lack of transparency in the process, as well as the content of the RFP presented to the board last month. Our trusted and proven Santa Barbara County Fire Department has qualified itself as a viable and responsible bidder for the county ambulance contract. They have proven repeatedly that they can be counted on to serve and protect our community. As part of their commitment to earning the contract, they have reached out to all of our local fire service agencies, hospitals throughout the county, as well as reaching out and meeting with the community leaders to strategize and look for ways to collaborate to provide a new higher level of service for our emergency services. Most people in the community would not know the current exclusive ambulance contract has never been out to bid since, since it was awarded some 30 years ago. It is time to see if we are still getting the best and highest value and service from AMR. As a for-profit company, I would think after 30 years of providing ex exclusive service, AMR would have confidence and welcome a fair and transparent process to win the bid again. Let's not delay the RFP process any longer. Our community deserves the best emergency service available, including ambulance service. It's imperative that you hold the departments accountable to the best and highest standards for public RFP process in Santa Barbara County. Our residents deserve nothing less. Thank you for your time. We will now go to Brian Fernandez to be followed by Derek Carlson, who is our final speaker. Brian. Madam 
Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Brian Fernandez and I'm the president of Santa Barbara County Firefighters Union Local 2046. Um, thank you for your advice in uh, today in giving us, us some guidance and what to address here. One thing that's not in the RFP that uh, potentially we would like to see, as a fire department we focus on prevention, preventing fires before they start reaching out to the community before it's in danger to help prevent those emergencies from happening. One way that we could do this would be through a co-response or through community paramedicine. Programs that would allow us to identify at risk people within our community to be able to reach out to them to prevent them from calling 911. Um, there's not a profit part of that that is beneficial to anybody, but it's the right thing to do. To add to the RFP, those components would be beneficial to the community. Over the last few weeks, your fire department has been engaging with the community for their input on this ambulance contract. We've met with mayors, city councils, CEOs, business leaders, hospital managers, and chambers of commerce. In this time, we've come to understand that most people in the community are not aware of all that goes into 911 response, or furthermore, even ambulance contracts and bids. Through these meetings, we have come to discover that the community at large trusts its fire departments. This trust has been established over years of demonstrating that we are here for our community. When the pandemic began, the fire department stepped in to assist public health with setting up and managing vaccination pods. We mobilized our incident management team and even had firefighter par paramedics providing vaccinations to the community. Not because there was a profit in it, but because it was the right thing to do. When there was no profit to be made on ambulance transports in New Kuyama or Vandenberg Village, we secured ambulances and provided service. That service for the community dates back to, dates back to 1973. We are responsive to our community and its needs, not because of the profit, but because again, it is the right thing to do. We witnessed firsthand what deficiencies are built into our system as the boots on the ground, and we would like to make recommendations to see a better system. Now, as I've stated before, this is not an attack on our brothers and sisters. None of this is meant with any disrespect to our brothers and sisters who work for the ambulance company. They are our teammates, and in some cases, literally part of the fire family. Together, we have experienced quite possibly some of the worst experiences of our life. We see them as members of the team and want an improved system for all of us. This is why we have asked for a fair RFP process so that we can include all of those that currently work in the system. I have personally sat through arbitration with the county to assure that incumbent members of the county EMS team are taken care of in the form of what our union represents. Thank you, that is your time. Thank you. We will now go to Derek Carlson, who's our final speaker on this item. Derek. Good afternoon, Chair Hartman, uh, members of the board. Uh, my name is Derek Carlson, and I'm with Marborg Industries. And when we uh, heard this issue coming forward, we felt uh, compelled to speak because we understand the importance of having a local companies, local organizations providing critical resources to this community. We understand the difference between having a locally rooted company and organization providing these services versus, versus international and national companies that have local offices in our community. When you call a local organization, you're gonna get a hold of the president, the chief, the captain, whatever the case may be. We've had the opportunity to work in coordinated disaster response efforts in this community. We understand what the scramble is to get resources coordinated. We understand that the success in getting that coordinated is having all of the leaders in the same room. You have the presidents, the captains, the chiefs, all being able to coordinate and make those real-time decisions. And finally, we know that locally based and rooted companies in Santa Barbara they give back and they support this community more than their international and national counterparts. And so we are supportive of having a process that supports local participation in this bid 
and supports county fire in, in this bid as well. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes public comment on this item. So uh, I'd like to take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back.
So we're reconvening the special May 31st meeting of the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors here in the Santa Barbara County hearing room. And uh, we've listened to uh, the presentations, we've listened to public comment. So now we're coming back and asking if, uh, if our LEMSA team or whether the consultants heard anything during public comment that they feel they need to uh, respond to at this point. Dr. Del Reynoso? Yes. Um, Chair Hartman, we'd like to, we have some comments that we'd like to start with. Absolutely. I'm comfortable taking the first. I think one of the um, higher level um, perspectives on the UCSB issue in the EOA, I think one of the fundamental um, constructs of, of EMS systems is to consider an EMS, or sorry, a, a system. And, and the county, uh, all boundaries of the county, and there are some areas that have high levels of reimbursement, and there are some areas that have pair mixes that result in lower levels of reimbursement. So one of the fundamental tenements of, of EMS system design is to include both areas within the EOA so that whoever has the contract and is providing transport it has access to the higher reimbursement areas, but in return, make sure that there's parity and so that the areas that might, might be neglected in other situations will have that, enjoy that same level of service. Um, so that's, that was one of the goals that we had in creating this EOA. So uh, while we're on it, so at UCSB, the students have to have insurance. So that's one of the more uh, reliably uh, reimbursing areas. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, and, and bear, pair with, like, there are other areas of the county that certainly don't have that same pair mix. So, yeah, that is one of the reasons why we included UCSB in the, in the EOA. I don't know. Steve, do you have any other perspective on that? Steve G. Thomas, did I characterize that correctly? All right. Um, in return, and in regards to response times, uh, I think that there is a large body of evidence that this issue, it has been studied quite extensively in terms of what response times, what impact they have on patient outcomes. Based on the body of literature that I'm aware of, 759 versus 959 is clinically equivalent. I wouldn't recommend increasing a response time um, if I felt like it was gonna have a detriment to patient outcomes. We certainly are aware that there are situations where you really do need someone there as soon as possible. Uh, and that's where our first response providers do a great job. They are trained in providing immediate interventions for overdoses when the lock zone, um, epinephrine for anaphylaxis, defibrillation, and high quality CPR for cardiac arrest. So those situations where minutes count, we, we really try to create a system where our emergency medical dispatchers will provide instructions to, to callers, but also that our first responders that arrive can, can initiate care quickly. Um, so that's um, one, of our, one of our main aspects of our, of our system. So as you're speaking, I'm getting some lights up here. I think mm -hmm. Supervisor Nelson on one of these points and then yeah. Supervisor Williams. Actually, sure. yeah, points on, on both of those issues, but going back to UCSB for a moment. So right now it's not an exclusive operating area or is it an exclusive operating area? What's the status of it currently? It is, um, so currently there is a um, agreement, my understanding is there's an agreement between the, the County Fire Department and UCSB for them to provide fire and ambulance transport services to the, the university area. Um, that, that arrangement has been respected, but the EMS authority has advised us that um, that is not an exclusive area and the only way to make it exclusive would be through the competitive bid process. So, so it's not an exclusive area, but it's only been, it's been acting as it is exclusive. And even though it's a high paying area, AMR hasn't come into that area, they, they could conceivably, is that my understanding? Potentially, yes. But even now, under the current contract. Yes, through That's you, Madam, uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'd like to kind of address that. Yeah. So it's not in exclusive within the contractual commitments that the LEMSA can have. So LEMSA can have non-exclusive or exclusive areas. So a non-exclusive area means that it could in theory, it is, not in theory, it is in practice, non-exclusive. So somebody else could come in there and compete for the contract. But because of the universities, the way it's constructed, it contractually bounds itself to somebody else. So it creates the exclusivity. So for the LEMSA to defeat that, the LEMSA would actually have to take a position that it, it wants to take, which is it, it's treating everything as an inclusive zone and at such removing the right of the university to sign its own contract. 
That's what it has to do procedurally. Um, and we have opinions from uh, the state that kind of are not hard and fast. It, it says you can keep it non-exclusive like it is today, or you can go down that route. So it is a policy position that needs to be taken. Uh, what uh, our doctor uh, said is absolutely correct. It does contribute somewhat to the finances, but it, is it material enough that this is the one you want to go after? That's really a question that is, is really a policy position, not necessarily a, a, a position that would change the RFP in any material way. It really is you have to make a decision if this is the one that you want and it, you think it's going to contribute enough that it's worth that political fight. That's one point. If you don't, then I, I don't. It could be done at a later date as well. It's it's a it's an authority within the LEMSA that can be taken on at a later date as well. So I think it, it begs the question. So it's a non-exclusive area. Right. operating exclusively under contract. And so um, that seems like that's maybe another model that we're not discussing here. And why is that exclusive to UCSB and not to other areas of the county? Uh, it, 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 you'd be, you do. In any federal uh, property, you would have some similar situations. Um, so it's not as unique as it may seem at, at first blush. It just this one is a heightened sensitivity because it exists. Um, so it, it, it's been brought to the, your, your attention, and this one you might have some authority to influence versus some federal properties that you probably would not have the authority to influence or change. The question becomes, again, a policy position, and, and, and that's really some of the challenges, like we spoke earlier, of not having direct access to the board and having these discussions as they were occurring. So you kind of got a, a, you know, all of them at the same time, and we're now having a, a, a fruitful discussion over all the different issues in front of you. So. I understand the federal property, and but UCSB is a state property, right? Yeah. And then the board here is responsible for the unincorporated area and yeah. the responsibility. So that would they have the ability also to contract in a non-exclusive area? Would they have the authority? What, what does that mean exactly? Like, give me another scenario. Well, we have a large area of the county. Could, could that be issued outside the RFP process through a contract with a, a provider? If, if the LEMSA, the, then the LEMSA would have to declare that non-exclusive and that's where we started at the beginning of this conversation, right. okay. where we carry all the risk. If you, in non-exclusive areas, the challenge is if they're profitable, then people will compete for them and they will want to make, they will want to be in that area. In all areas that are not, fundamentally they will not compete or not enter those markets. And I gave a very concrete example uh, when we were discussing that. We are dealing with that in another state, um, but in, in Jefferson County, Alabama, where that is exactly the scenario. It's a, it's a non-exclusive area. All the areas that are profitable get nice service, and others don't get any ambulance service. So you have to balance that out, the risk-reward of doing that. And, and this is one of those scenarios where I think as Dr. Knight pointed out, it's very important that you keep your inclusivity for the, uh, you know, a, a very controlled, inclusive contract. The question whether or not you need to carve in the university, that's, a, like I said, a policy position. And do you want to do it now? Do you want to do it later? Uh, it, it really, it just, it has to inform the, the RFP so that they can bid it appropriately. Sure. And as you talk about these non-exclusive areas that are not profitable, like Vandenberg Village or Cuyamo, and then that fallback or safety net has been the county to be responsible for those areas, right? Okay. I have some thoughts on um, response time, but we can get into that a little bit later. Sure. I, I'm just now trying to stay at the 30,000 foot level and we'll add any additional issues we heard about. I have several uh, and just get basic clarification. Supervisor Williams? Well, I, I just wanted to, to understand your, your opinion of the um, necessity of uh, dispensing with the shot clock provision. I, I mean, for a public agency to decide not to pay itself would essentially require two of our biggest agencies, Santa Barbara and S Santa Maria, to go from BLS to ALS service, right? I mean, you know, you can't, they, 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 they so, so how is that a competitive advantage? That's very expensive to, yeah, so. for our two biggest agencies to do that. So, uh, I, you know, I, I guess, and I, I guess maybe it just boils down to the question, do you believe that if we chose to preserve the status quo 
in response time and in uh, shot clock provisions, does that uh, uh, somehow interfere with the LEMSA's medical control? Yeah, so, uh, well, I can't speak to LEMSA's medical control, but let, let, let me, 30,000 foot is a, a good place to start. So let's back up just for a second for at least what the intent was, okay? So the intent, examining the, the compare and contrast between a public entity bidder and a private bidder, the, the stop the clock fees, we wanted to enshrine that. We wanted to make sure that the fees that were coming in today and distributed would continue tomorrow in the RFP and enshrine. The challenge from what we viewed as a competitive process is that if, the, if a public entity decided not to distribute funds either to itself or amongst you know, other comparing agencies that are part of, we don't know what the bid looks like, whatever that, that organization looks like, then there's a distinct competitive advantage because those aren't actual real dollars. So what we wanted to prevent was a private bidder having to contribute, let's just say approximately $1.3 million or $1.4 million towards stop the clock funds, but a public entity wouldn't have to specifically allocate those dollars. And I'd refer to that more as a fungible experience, right? So what we wanted to do is insulate that. So the strategy was to enshrine that the same dollars coming in, the same dollars went out, were just housed in a different manner for where the dollars went and who distributed them so that everybody would be contributing the same dollars towards stop the clock. And then in that sense, the stop the clock is enshrined, right? The fire departments would continue to do exactly what they're doing today. They would continue to get the same funding that they had today. So the, the downstream repercussions of what the ambulance response time benefit of stop the clock is would be codified as well. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be as variable as do I have an agreement and not have an agreement. What we attempted to do is say, let's just use all those dollars, take it, make sure that the procurement lens was fair, distribute those dollars back to the first responders with the expectation they would continue to provide stop the clock as they do today. So all of that motion was really intended from the procurement lens only and to enshrine that the current practice of stop the clock and, and the response time performance continued to, uh, tomorrow in the RFP as it did today. That was really the intent of, of that scenario. So it, we, we didn't take away the, the dollars, at least that wasn't the intent, I should say. Um, and the, the di distribution of those dollars was supposed to be the same and the performance was supposed to be the same. So if there's some things that need to be cleaned up along the way with that, absolutely. But our goal, and, and we met with the committee's goal yesterday on a meeting on that specific issue, because uh, inadvertently some budget dollars got shifted around, we want to make sure that our commitment is that those, those dollars are continue in the RFP just as they continue today. We, we didn't want to materially change that. But doesn't the removal, the provision, absolve uh, folks from showing up to two minutes earlier? Let, let, let Even if the financial, the financial streams are still in, in place. No, well, well, let me try to answer it this way. If, if, if the first response leg of the system design continues to perform post RFP as it does today, and the ambulance side of the, of the system design continues to perform as it does today into the future, then by and large, might be some nuances here and there, idiosyncrasies, but by and large, the system design is is intended to perform the way it is today. That's, that was the broad view. The, the, the delicate dance that we were trying to do is more about procurement rather than getting into the operations of, of the system design. So from that perspective, when, you know, if, we, if we take stop the clock and translate that back to response time, it's really a policy decision uh, for the board on, wh on where they want to land. We and the committee worked hard to find the right lane that we felt was good both clinically and would be fiscally sustainable within the environment that we had. And on the county's behalf, we wanted to make sure that the revenue estimates were on the conservative side, uh, just to make sure that you had the greatest potentiality of attracting as many bidders as you can and making sure the system would be long-term sustainable. So from that perspective, I think we hit the mark. But we don't set local policy, and we really don't, 
We don't have a hard position on it one way or the other. We attempted to enshrine what you had today and, and make sure that it passed what we thought was the procurement test, but ultimately it's the board's decision on where you want the response time just like it was uh, all these years. So uh, going back to um, our LEMSA side and asking about anything you heard during public comment that you think deserves greater clarification before we start up here. And I will um, ask Nick on Zoom, um, give him a chance first to make his comments, and then we will make ours. Uh, thanks, Dr. Donoso and uh, Chair Hartman and distinguished members of the board. Um, you know, essentially, I think we have a lot of passion in, in that room uh, and passion centered around the patient. And I think um, we are in the right place talking about this and, and really engaging the conversation. Um, and as we, there's a lot of, a lot of elements in the RFP that I think uh, certainly do deserve additional clarification. Um, certainly the intent is to ensure that we execute on the board's um, direction, which was to ensure we have a fair and competitive process um, that widens the bidding pool to all potential bidders. And that certainly was the intent. Um, and we're happy to clarify any of the things that may be considered um, non-fair, non-competitive um, today as we move forward and, and uh, look at the other options that are being presented. Yeah, I think, um, you know, during public comment, like I certainly heard a lot of, of feedback that we could incorporate. I think we could come up with an RFP that, that is productive. Uh, and numerous speakers commented on the collaboration and, and the way our teams function while on scene. And I think that's our goal and really um, the model that we should strive for is, is however this shakes out that whoever's responding is working well together on scene. And so I think, um, you know, I'm excited to see that we can craft an RFP that, that really achieves that mission. And the only thing I would add um, is that I heard some comments about transparency, data, community engagement, and the current EMS system has those uh, uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, and we're happy to come back to your board uh, for an annual report where we talk about the system achievements as well as the system's engagement and the, um, the data that's being um, asked about as well as the uh, uh, financials. So we're looking forward to doing that at a future date. So one of the issues I was going to put up here that I heard in public comment was a community advisory group. And so Dr. Del Reynoso, are you saying that that already exists but it isn't part of the RFP? Yes. And uh, Nick, can you talk about the various um, uh, committees that we have in place? Certainly. So Supervisor Hartman, um, Chair Hartman, excuse me. The, um, we have two main uh, community involvement opportunities um, that are open to the public meetings. Uh, there is the Emergency Medical Services Advisory Committee, which is an open meeting um, that includes members from pre-hospital, dispatch, um, the hospital staff, uh, and we are um, we meet three times a year uh, in which we discuss uh, that group provides policy guidance and just general EMS system guidance um, to the medical director who is the chair of that committee. Then we also have our contract compliance committee, which includes members of uh, the pre-hospital fire service, includes a um, member of the community, and also includes members of the hospital staff and members of board staff. Um, that is a meeting that also occurs three times a year and is open to the public and has um, discusses all contractual performance from all providers that are under contract with the LMSA. And then there are various other specialty care meetings, which engage hospital staff and pre-hospital providers and where we talk about the STEMI system, the trauma system, um, the stroke system. We have CQI meetings that meet on a routine basis. Uh, we recently uh, had an ad hoc committee meeting for the EMT optional scope providers in which we brought all those providers together to look at um, how that system can be enhanced. And we have various other meetings as well. We also have a um, out of hospital executive committee meeting, um, which is an ad hoc meeting that meets with um, all of the fire chiefs and AMR as well. So um, there are a number of opportunities. And what we put forth in the RFP is actually have a yearly or annual board meeting um, that discusses the contractor's performance as well as all the other elements in the contract. Um, the, def the definitive elements of that annual presentation have yet to be defined, but it's certainly our intent to come yearly in front of the board um, to discuss all the aspects of that contract performance. So I guess I'm still not clear about, I mean, the RFP is 
a strong foundation for the ultimate contract that we put together. All of these community uh, engagement processes are part of the obligation of whoever wins the, the RFP contest. Is that correct? Sure, I mean, the, the committee meetings are all, um, are, are there regardless of who's winning the contract or who wins the contract. Um, they exist for all the providers um, with the intent of providing advice to the medical director uh, to make decisions on um, system enhancements in the system operation. So are they an obligation of the person who, or of the entity that wins the contract? They will be obligated to attend, absolutely, but the meetings are held and run by the EMS agency staff. Sure. So I'm just wondering, shouldn't shouldn't the RFP at least spell out these obligations? The the RFP spells out that the winning bidder is required to comply with uh, county policy, and that county pol there's a county policy on meetings, um, which articulates all of the meetings we have, their schedule, and their intent. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Through you, Madam Chair, can I just add something? Uh, part of the things that's, that we're missing as we think of an RFP is there's an entire section that's really dedicated to innovation that generally what we see is these are held pretty close to the vest until, you, until they get put into the response package, right? That is where you're going to distinguish which one you prefer. If, if you read something and they say, well, we have, are committing in our response package to a meeting a month and these are the people we're going to meet, you are going to evaluate that in the innovation section and say, that's got a lot of merit, so I like that. So that's really why we don't want to get too prescriptive because we don't want to take away the innovation of the response. Thank you, that's helpful. And future system enhancements that are now evaluated for 10 points, that's part of that as well? Yes, that's that's exactly where you get future enhancements, other okay. thought processes. Uh, we heard some community outreach already here in the room, so I'm looking forward to seeing what comes up. So I think Dr. Del Reynoso, ha has your team uh, commented on everything in, during public comment that you wanted to reply to? I believe so. Okay, thank you. And the Fitch team, is there anything you would like to add uh, after what you've heard during public comment? No, I think I think the general topics that you have on the table on the screen were, were both in the public comments and, and on your radar. So I think we'll just address it that okay. way if that's acceptable. And let me ask any board members, are there any other issues that you'd like to put up here? I there there yeah, there, there are a couple that I had. One is the integration into the dispatch and response system of the ambulance. I, I think that's worth at least discussion. And then um, the, I, I, I don't think we have to resolve it, but I think it's worth talking about the ordinance versus resolution. And then I, in terms of scoring, I have some specific things, but can talk about it there. All right, so uh, any other questions, Supervisor Nelson? Yeah, Chairman, I think, when, I think we're already there, but I think it might be good to get, make sure it's memorialized here, though. Um, are we moving forward with the current RFP, or are we gonna change it? And I think, I think we're all looking to change it, but I think that's probably one of the first decision points that I think might be something we could get off the table quickly so that we know what our new timeline is moving forward. I, I guess it's conceivable we could go through all of these and say no changes, um, but, but I think we all are eager to uh, consider that, but maybe that's something I, I think we would do at the end. Any other issues? All right, I, I think we're ready to start then at the top of the list uh, and see about um, I guess we're going to start with uh, exclusive operating areas. And uh, County Council, I, I think you had a little more you could add about this. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, I'll just clarify for the board. Um, the board has authority to make a re recommendation on um, the creation of the exclusive operating area. For this RFP, it's not required to include UCSV, so this that is something that could be treated separately and at a later date. 
Um, so it's it's really up to your board to uh, to consider that today. And if we did consider it separately at a later date, would it be subject to the contract with UCSB, or would it have to be uh, another RFP for an exclusive operating area? Well, it's first it's the determination of whether it's operating as an exclusive area now. Um, it, it, it sounds like, um, from what you heard before, it's determined it's non-exclusive. Um, but there is an existing contract uh, between UCSB and County Fire. So one option would be to leave it the way it is now and have it be non-exclusive, which I think um, might we might need to clarify that in our EMS plan with the state. Um, the other option would be to create a, a separate exclusive operating area of its own, and then you would need to competitively bid in order to give an exclusive contract for that. So, um, Supervisor Hart, do you have some ideas about this, given UCSV is in your district now? Um, I think maybe it gets answered by the whole context of what we're doing. I, I don't have a specific um, proposal right now. Well, my sense is maybe we leave it as it is unless we absolutely have to change it. Um, yeah, Chair Harmon, I would support that as well. Um, I think at this point, um, the relationships there, it gets, it gets a little uh, muddy. Um, it's already under contract. It's, it is something that is, is successful at this point from everything I've heard. So I don't know if throwing it into the mix here as we move forward with this RFP and exclusive operating area, if it makes sense to go through all that extra work to, to include it. Does anybody have a counter view or argument? Okay, on to the stop the clock. Supervisor Williams. Uh, I, I think that um, we should pr preserve in the RFP the existing system. If um, a, uh, you, know, to, you know, how I would see it taking place with a public to public, uh, it, you know, you still want the incentive to uh, have paramedics there as soon as possible, and you still want to have uh, um, an incentive for there to be stabilization um, from another agency as soon as possible. So, you know, I, I, I think we should preserve the existing system. Um, I am, I do not consider it a competitive advantage for one side or the other because for uh, the public agencies to get a competitive advantage in that system, they would have to upgrade two of their largest agencies to ALS, which is expensive in and of itself. Um, so uh, I, 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 I am not concerned if we preserve the existing um, shot clock system in the RFP, which would mean changing the RFP, as I understand it. Supervisor Nelson. Yes, thank you, Chair. I was going to hold you to it anyway. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I mentioned it a few weeks ago. This is one of the biggest issues for me in this contract that I don't feel comfortable moving forward with an RFP that, in my opinion, takes a step backwards by extending these response times. I understand what Fitch was trying to do, and, I, and out, of, out of due respect for Dr. Shepard, I've heard the reasons why, you know, that there's no potential clinical differences in, on outcomes on that two minutes. Um, you know, I, I still, as a decision maker and as a policy maker here, I, st I still w see that as de a degradation of going from the 759 to a 959 without some type of stop the clock um, measure put in place. So um, I, I would not be supporting any RFP that, that um, takes a step backwards in response times. And for, my, for myself, I, I wouldn't want to explain that to the public. So is there general agreement to preserve the current? Um, I see a lot of nodding. So if, if that stopped the clock, do we have anything more to say about response time? Um, only, you know, only in general, there are some places that where in the criteria, having a pass fail may be necessary, but where there should be some kind of points 
where you exceed, if, you, if both entities pass, but some is passing by more, there, to me it should be reflected in the, in the, po in the point system. So I'm not, I don't want to mess with the pass fail on some of these things that are uh, truly necessary, but there should be an incentive beyond passing in some, in, in some of the criteria. And I thought of this being one of those criteria where it seems to me that there should be an incentive. Mr. Fuente? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, the challenge you have is demonstrable. Right, that's that's the real challenge in in allowing an agency that has not done transport before to attest in some manner without being able to demonstrate that they can meet a superior response time is is going to be extraordinarily complex for you to evaluate or to to give you an honest answer. So that may be more true in the future if you if you if you know a, a second round and you go out to market five years from now and they now two the, the public entity has won and they they went through that and they can demonstrate that you might have something to stand on 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 a stop the a clock or response time metric so you got to be just careful we're, we're we're trying to allow as large a, a, a tranche of people to to bid on this contract so it it that's that's where it becomes very tricky for what you want is somebody to commit to the stop the clock, the, the 1.4 million or whatever the ma value amount is that it's committed to by every party who goes in. So everybody who bids has to have that criterion obligation. And then you want to enshrine a response time. Um, and the current response time is that if you, if you buy services for stop the clock, then you get the extra two minutes. So if you want to enshrine that, that's fine as well in the RFP. But that, that would be as far as I would go. If I tried to evaluate it and somebody said to me, hey, but I can do 859, the first question I would have is, how do you demonstrate that to me? How could you demonstrate, if you've not done it, that you can do it? And that would, that would muddy the waters in a dramatic way. For, for me, I think that would be extraordinarily difficult to, to, to measure and evaluate. And that's why it's a, more of a pass-fail at that point. Does that satisfy you, Supervisor Williams? Maybe. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I got to think about it a little bit. Supervisor Nelson. Yes. Um, I was a little concerned with what I just heard, um, that I, what we might be communicating here. I don't really care about the 1.4 million. I care about the response time. Okay. So that can be accomplished by just having more ambulances, and we can commit to having enough ambulances to be there at 8.59. So the money's not the issue for me at all. It's about response time, making sure that there is um, a paramedic, you know, an ALS or BLS option there. Um, hitting our constituents as quickly as possible. So I want to make sure it's not about the 1.4. If that's that's one of the techniques to do it, I'm, I understand that. But it's not the only way to accomplish that. Uh, uh, th yeah. Through you, Madam uh, Chair, I just want to add one more that we kind of discussed as a policy and then we kind of abandoned it. Because the other way to level that playing field and I, is to allow everybody to put in a rapid response model, right? So they are their own first responders. And you could allow, it used to be that way millions of years ago before the, the fire evolution where they became the primary first response. But if you went all the way back to like Kansas City, they were originally responding. They were their own first response. So there are innovative ways to respond to that. And I think we can come up with some language that allows exactly what you intend. So you, you can either purchase that, you can deliver that, or you can, well, however you want, but you meet this response time with, with a, a level of criteria that you get to. So as our current Accumbent provider prohibited from having a rapid response right yeah. now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and and could you elaborate? I mean, is it for what are the reasons for that? Are there good policy reasons? Nick, do you have the response for that? Chair Hartman. Um, I'm not sure that AMRA is prohibited from having a first response unit or a quick response vehicle. I'm, we have to confirm the exact language in the current contract, but it's my understanding that they can have a quick response vehicle um, that enables arrival within seven minutes and 59 seconds um, would potentially would, would be there, but the, the stop the clock provision is a little more complicated than um, is not encompass the entire geography of the system. So we'd have to look at that in detail, but I don't believe the language is prohibitive of allowing them to have that. So I think where we are is kind of preserving the system as it is or moving to a rapid response model. Um, and I'd like other board members to weigh in on that if they could. 
I, I, I think we have the rapid response model now. I mean, that's that's where, um, and that's why I was really concerned about the degradation through going to 959 and, and codifying that because I feel like that that's a step backwards from what we currently have, which is you're gonna have somebody on scene 90% of the time, 759 or greater. It may be a fire truck, but it or it may be an ambulance, and so that that's the responsibility of AMR currently as the incumbent provider to make sure that happens. If an if a fire truck is not available, then they may need to make sure that their their staff or uh, their assets are deployed in a way where they can still meet that. And so, um, so the current model is okay with you. It, it is on okay. making sure that there's there is somebody there within seven hundred seven minutes and fifty nine seconds. Okay, I think there's general agreement. All right. Madam Chair, if you if, if you don't mind, I, I think Knight, we're going to yes. need. <laughs> I think we're going to need a, a little more direction on that. I, I understand the board's position to enshrine the stop the clock, and the effective response force associated with response times associated with that. But when it comes back to the procurement, what was posited was that there was a mechanism where all proposers would have to to invest in that $1.4 million for stop the clock. And under the current situation, the contract is between the provider, whoever wins the contract, and the first response agencies. If a public entity wins that, that was part of the original confusion. So I, I think if we separate the operational components that I, we're getting clear direction from what the board is looking for on that, we still need a little guidance on, our, is it acceptable to strategize on a mechanism to make sure of how we receive and distribute those dollars that is transparent, accountable, under the county, county umbrella, so that none of the fire departments are, are harmed in the process and we enshrine the response right. time and the stop the clock. And Ms. Masnisich, did you have more to add? Chair, uh, Mr. Knight just articulated what I was going to indicate is specifically stating that um, we needed to develop a mechanism in the way he articulated so that we are again evening the playing field would be important. And so would you remind me how the current draft RFP handles this? Sure, the, and, and <laughs> yeah. So the current proposal, the way it was, is it was going those those funds would be going to an EMS enhancement fund under the LEMSA's umbrella. Even the public entity would pay in if they Even won the Even the public contract. entity would pay in. And, and it was really just a, a warehouse, and there was some background discussion of, of why that had some merit. Um, what happened recently, though, was that those funds were reallocated from a budget perspective that went to the state. And that's why we were trying to reinforce that we very transparently, our intent has always been that those full dollars come through and those full dollars are expended just the way they are today. So one of the strategies I think I think the, the assistant administrator was describing is there's probably a, a mechanism underneath the county umbrella that probably instills a little more confidence and transparency about how those funds are gonna be managed. And we just need some time to figure out what's the right legal course that meets both the policy and the, and the legal parameters in order to do that. Yes, Madam Chair, meaning that we would work with council, auditor, controller, and of course the EO's office to set up that mechanism to hold the funds. Okay, so that's an outstanding issue that we yes. still have to resolve, how to handle that on the public side. Uh, Supervisor Nelson? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still stuck here because mm -hmm. it seems like the 1.4 is not, again, the issue for me. Again, if mm -hmm. that may cost more than 1.4 if, if a new provider comes in and wants to contract with uh, first responders to do that. It may go up to 2.4, right? So, okay. and if that's too expensive for them to be able to operate, then they also have to work into their proposal a way to provide that themselves, right? So that's kind of where I'm trying to get us to here is again, I wanna make sure that we have first response or mm -hmm. some type of uh, service to our, our residents within that eight minute period that we're looking at now. So it's, right. I think the 1.4 is getting stuck on the status quo, and that's exactly the opposite reason of why we're going through this process, is the status quo. We're trying to move beyond that, and I understand that's okay. we're trying to enshrine some of the existing practices, but this mm -hmm. whole process for me has been all about integration, mm -hmm. and 
Um, there's a lot of different ways to integrate, and it's not just by throwing $1.4 million in a pool and seeing how we divide it up later on so they can buy um, you know, medical response equipment. Um, I think there's a lot of ways to, to skin the cat, and eventually when we get to the criteria, that's gonna be one of my things that I'm gonna add. Uh, understood, and, and I think, um I think we have to be cautious about how much <laughs> dialogue we have at, you know, at, at this stage about all the different mechanisms and, and how that comes together. So if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm fully hearing and the board's direction is to enshrine the, enshrine the performance related to it, both on both sides, the first response and the ambulance side, to at least as good as it is today, fair? Okay, so understanding that, the mechanism of how that's funded has to have a starting place somewhere. So if, if the direction isn't to continue with current values, then there, there could be some kind of a cost allocation strategy that we put in there, but again, that will, that's just another layer of element that we, that we would have to address, which, which is acceptable to do. The difficulty that we had is we wanted to be sensitive to all the first responders and the quality work that they're doing, not to, as, as Mr. Fuentes mentioned, there are other ways to improve response time performance in the system. What would be at risk is the current funding that the first responders enjoy for the level of service that they provide today. So we're, we're trying to balance not harming existing agencies in the process of, of this. So you, you, you can at least understand that there's a, there's a little give and take on that, and, and one is a more draconian approach that does level the playing field, but has some zero-sum implications for the current provider. So we were trying to, trying to do at least what the current status quo had in the system and then build upon that. So hopefully that helps. I understand what you're trying to do, and, I, and I'm trying to I understand what I'm trying to get to, and I'm not yeah. sure if we're aligning, but I guess this is part of the discussion that we're having. Supervisor Hart. You know, maybe a way to bridge this um, is that what we're building with the RFP is the status quo floor, and then what we're looking for from bidders is innovation and, and exceeding that floor. And so maybe that's a value in the whole product that we're trying to hit. I think that's extremely helpful, and I, w I wonder if that gives you enough to work with or we need to make any additional, uh, give any additional guidance from up here. No, I, I think the message is loud and clear. I think we're, we have something to work with there. We'll work with Terry on, on the mechanism. Thank you. I yep. think that was helpful on both ends here. So financial security and bonds. And w would you give us just a brief where we are now in the draft RFP and some of the issues that have been raised about this? Uh, certainly. Madam Chair, so the current process, the way that it's structured, it allows for a public entity to create an enterprise fund. And an enterprise fund, whether in California or other states, is this ostensibly a separate accounting mechanism to account for your expenses or to account for dollars that are designated for whatever purpose you designate them for. We understood in a conversation with the RFP Advisory Committee that typically in other areas where uh, municipal services provide, say, the EMS transport apparatus, then they don't, they, they're usually, that if you're, you're going to commit the surety, the reality is I don't know what the state would say if we said that. That might, that might get pushed back. I don't know. But, but yeah, that's, it's, it's just an surety. That's all it is. It's the equivalent of a bond in the private sector to the public sector. That's what we're trying to accomplish in that. So my colleagues on the board, I need you to weigh in. Supervisor Williams, never shot. So the shot. question is a, 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 a letter on their existing reserves or putting some, you know, putting it in an enterprise fund? The question is one or the, is that what you're positing one or one or the, the other? Right, and, and the enterprise is just an example. I mean, it's a restricted fund is really the, the point. So if enterprise is a hang up and you have another mechanism that you prefer, we're just looking to have them as restricted funds. And, and Madam Chair, just to confirm it to Fitch as well, it specifically indicates that gov 
Governmental proposers may pledge receivable ass or assets to satisfy performance security. We need to make some decision here. I, which one? Either one. I mean, it sounds like he's open to just about any language. I mean, as long as it's a restricted fund, we can commit okay. to a restricted yeah. fund. Yeah. So, okay. so you support the restricted yes, fund? Absolutely. Okay. And, and I do too, for the reasons you said, the the level playing field. So, so I, I see at least three nodding heads. I'm a, I'm okay with it. My my quandary was more of which kind are we talking. Yeah, no, no objection. Okay. Let's see. The incumbent workforce. Mr. Fuentes, you can start us off. Through you, Madam Chair, this is one of those where we really are walking a balancing act that I, I I'd like to say I, I have a superiorly elegant answer for you. I, I do not, um, because you do have to protect it. If it's a if it's a competitive private that wins it, you you would want them to take it over and take it over exactly as it is. You don't want them to bid it on day one salaries and then hire back the force and giving them no option to say I get you a 25 year paramedic or a 35 year paramedic of your year, but if you want to work for us, we pay you at day one salary. That would be inappropriate, not acceptable. Conversely, though, and I do understand if it's a public entity and they're not going to consume the entirety, they would want to have their latitude and how they're going to hire, what's the lateral positions and negotiations with the unions. Um, that's all true as well. So um, I, I, I don't have an answer on how to handle both. That's why we kind of left it as a optional descriptive value and we didn't weigh it because we couldn't figure out how to weigh that appropriately because we are going to cross that line and having worked both in the private and the public, I, I fully understand they're totally different and it's almost impossible for the public to say, to commit to something like that without negotiating with the unions pretty heavily that they're going to allow, you know, somebody coming in from the street to have 35 years and, and be able to bump in seniority and get better shifts and whatever, whatever. Um, and then, but, but you want to protect that if it goes from private to private because you, you want to take care of your workforce. So I don't know if that helped or confused the, the issue. Well, but and, and I, Council, I think maybe you, you had some thoughts on some language changes or? Madam Chair, members of the board. So the, the incumbent workforce concept um, has actually been recently put into statute in AB 389 as one of the potential things that you can consider. Um, I do think it's important to point out that it's not any points, so it's right. encouraged. Um, but there are some ways that you could clarify that section to just make it a little bit more clear. Um, because I think some of the concerns that are stated uh, are concerned with, with if it were a public bidder, you may have requirements of how you do recruitment and what classification you put someone at. And so just clarifying that that entities can follow their own, are expected to follow their own laws and regulations, I think might help um, resolve that issue. And uh, we did get a table provided by uh, public comment provided by FIRE, and they proposed some language there that, um, I think it's on page four of that document. I don't think I have it. Madam Chair, I think you're referring to um, this section should be rewritten to require non-incumbent proposers to describe their plan to recruit and hire the incumbent workforce and the incumbent provider to describe its plan to retain and prevent attrition of incumbent workers. And I think if the board is happy with that language, I think that works. It's just clarifying that we want to encourage the providers to, to use the incumbent workforce if possible, and they need to, to, whichever entity receives the bid needs to do it compliant with their own laws and regulations. I, I, I think that's important. Um, I, I think there seems to be a really big 
understanding gap, um, uh, you know, because my my feeling is that any uh, worker that uh, with the current provider that uh, you know should be being taken by a successor provider uh, unless they didn't pass a background check, um, uh, you know, uh, and you know, people who don't want to make the transfer, you know, they don't have to. I, I can't do anything for them, but 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 to me, anybody who is making the background check, we should be take, taking. Um, Supervisor Lavanito. Thank you. And I, this is one of the most important parts of it for me because um, I, I just want to know how we have that. I mean, obviously there's a sense of distrust and um, I, first off, I would have to say that regard, well, it, anytime you're talking about somebody's job, obviously emotions get very high and I understand why people are very concerned. This would be the most concerned to me. I just went through a redistricting thing when I found out I was losing my job. I got a little, it, it, it gets a point on it real quick. So how do we, I want to see, like what I hear from FIRE is, obviously, if you take over this, if they happen to be the winner, that their intention is that they would bring these employees over. That's great if you're an employee now, but how do we have that oversight or how do we have that built in that we would somehow, or how, how I guess, what's the transparency and the accountability of what's that check for that promise, right? So like how, how is that managed? How are we able to determine whether or not that's happening or not gonna happen? And I guess we're way early, we're in the RFP process, but I wanna see it written in the RFP so that, and I'm not sure you can, to be able to give people a sense, a better sense of security and what will happen. Um, because I know one side's like, we're all gonna lose our jobs, and the other side's like, no, we would definitely hire you, but how that really actually happens is pretty important, I think. And I don't know how to write that protection in, other than I can tell you that my personal um, feeling is, I think most of it, we all you share speak this. speak for the entire yes, board, go ahead. That we would, you know, that's our goal, is that not one person would lose their job through this process, however it comes out. Not, but I know, just because we deal a lot with um, employee uh, negotiations that there are a million different things about you know service amount of time and who gets what shifts and all those things that could be would have to be worked out down the road but how do we build that protection into this RFP what's the best way to do it other than just saying that I mean the language that's provided here is very basic I'm not sure it's gonna make anybody feel any better um, and I'm just wondering if there's some kind of belts and suspenders type of thing that we say that you know this is our intention, and this is how we would follow up and do that. And, and for me, that it, it aligns with civil service rules. I mean, I, I'm not sure that the way it's written now does. Supervisor Nelson? Yeah, but Chair Hartman, I mean, civil service rules are afforded to civil service employees, and employees at AMR aren't civil service employees at this time. They could potentially become them. So I don't want to grant people rights that they don't have yet. I mean, I would, I'm would. i with Steve and the entire board on um, the idea to protect. Um, you know, and that's just not if, if, if AMR isn't selected. If AMR is not selected and there's another uh, private ambulance provider that's selected through this RP process, um, we want to make sure those people are taken care of. I mean, there are people in our community. They live in my neighborhood. Um, coach baseball with some of them. So, like, these are people that we want to take care of. Um, but I, I'm, I'm a little afraid of giving, you know, already declaring them somebody's employees and, and giving them um, protections that aren't quite um, afforded um, because that may have other um, implications that we, we aren't ready to, to deal with. Assistant CEO Moss Nisich, do you have your <laughs> some ideas? Chair, I think on this one, if, if the board, the board seems to be um, clearly expressing your intent. I think this is one where we do need to come back and work with council on really wordsmithing the language. So if you could just give us the recommended, your your intent, we'll, we will need to come back on this one. And Unless you, council uh, has other language sure. you can suggest now, we might need to do a little bit more research. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, 
I'm not sure you're going to be able to find something more specific at this stage. I think having the bidder put in their plan, I think, is um, to recruit and hire is probably um, the extent to what we could ask for at this stage. Um, right. So as far as civil service, I mean, I think when we talk about uh, for public hiring, what we would do is you know, we would need to open a recruitment and it would be a competitive recruitment. Um, and then there's criteria set by classifications. People who have experience are going to do well in that setting. Um, but ultimately, it's also up to the individuals to apply. It's an open process. And so that's part of what's hard to score it um, or to measure it is that you know, people need to want to come and work for a new provider and then go through that application process. But people who have experience tend to do better in those recruitments than people that don't. Supervisor Hart? Yeah, I, I think this is, you know, the values of the board are very clear, and I think that, that we're communicating that well. It's still hard to hear, I'm sure, for other folks. But, you know, there's a, mo a couple of different models of change here. We've got, you know, the existing private sector company. There's potentially another private sector company that would bid. Then there's the public entity. So there's apples and oranges here. Uh, but I'm, I recall when... Um, the city of Santa Barbara renegotiated its waste hauling contract. These are not obviously the same things, but um, the, the uh, local company has almost exclusively hired the existing workforce because who else would be better positioned to do the job? And we've got professional people doing that job. You know, the, if another ambulance company were to come in and were to somehow win, win the bid, where, what pool would they go to for employees? Obviously, you know, this existing workforce. And as um, council mentioned, you know, looking for experienced people, that's where you're gonna go. So I, I, you know, I don't know what more we can say in terms of language, you know, to be specific about this, but um, the intent is clear to have, you know, the professional people that are doing the work now be first in line for new positions if there's gonna be a change. Supervisor Williams, then Lavanino. Yeah, my, my su suggestion would be that any bidder um, detail, detail their plans, um, as has been suggested, uh, to recruit and hire the incumbent workforce and how it, con it corresponds to our intent to preserve their wages and benefits um, uh, uh, and employment as, uh, uh, you know, um, as part of our uh, family of emergency workers. Thank you, and yeah, I just thought it was. I mean, important. this is yeah. this is yeah, this is just the way I I, I hear it. You know, notwithstanding the tension that's in this room today, on a normal basis, what I hear is they're already part are part of a family, right? Mm -hmm. And we just need to uh, make sure the bidders uh, uh, demonstrate and and detail that. Yeah, and I'm fine with that. I just thought, I I think it was helpful for folks to hear from all of us where our position is. I don't think you can write it any clearer than, than what we have. So I'm okay with, with the change that was proposed. And then um, whoever's bidding on this should hear loud and clear that this is a priority for all of us. Okay, the next item. So that takes us to scoring criteria. And, and within this are, are a number of issues. Some of the items are pass-fail, and people have said that maybe some of those should be evaluated uh, with actual points. Um, I think uh, minimum qualifications and financial uh, situation were, were two of those. And then another issue is the future system enhancements, and that's currently at 10 points, and there have been some recommendations that that be a higher point value, and given that this en encapsulates the innovation that we're seeking over time from this contract, it's worth discussing it in greater detail, I think. So maybe we should come back to, to the Fitch team and ask about the pass-fail and, and how you came to that. Certainly. So the... Well, 
can I add a just a, sure. a question on, on, onto that? That the can you envision the value in incentivizing um, better than a, a a pass in awarding points in any of those categories on top of passing? I, I understand that some of these things have to be pass fail from that from a intuitive intuitively. But why not have an additional incentive of, at least in some of those cases, um, uh, to perform better than that? Certainly through you, uh, Madam Chair. Can, can you give an example uh, of an area where, say, someone could propose something additional or above and beyond, say, what the, the requisite specification calls for? And I ask because the the way that the scoring methodology is currently established, we've got a baseline set of categories, operations, administrative, clinical, regulatory, uh, default termination clauses and whatnot. And then from there, we worked with the RFP advisory committee to develop specific criterion within those based off of kind of our baseline uh, that we recommended. And then the, the integer point value assigned was you know very much a collaborative discussion with the committee. We don't have a hard and fast position per se on the numeric value assigned to any specific criterion within the broader categories. Um, so if that's something that you know needs further modification or adjustment, then then you know we can have that conversation and, and adjust where needed. The specific pass fail mechanisms were were discussed amongst the draft that the state provided feedback on, uh, as well as some additional, uh, I guess you could say, mechanisms. And that's where the, the good, exceptional, uh, unacceptable uh, scale came from, or, or from those conversations, that was the genesis for that scale. And so we, we don't have a hard and fast position on any numeric score for any specific criterion, but as far as, say, changing something from a pass fail to, say, a scored component, it, it, is there just an example that you guys could provide or this, this body could provide that could shed light on what that might look like? Well, I'll jump in. The, the meets minimum qualifications, does that go to the employees or just, I mean, could you elaborate that one, why that's pass fail? or the financial assessment, both of those are question marks for me. Sure, so the, the financial assessment aspect, it speaks specifically to the organization that's proposing having the financial depth and breadth to be able to perform the scope of work required so that an entity that hypothetically uh, does not contain the physical assets or human capital necessary to perform the scope of work. Perhaps they have a license and they own an ambulance company, but they, they have nowhere near the magnitude or resources that would be needed to perform the scope of work. They would not be fiscally you know, viable in this, in this situation or financially viable in this situation, so they would fail there. The other financial aspect of this is an independent assessment from someone that's not a part of the proposal review committee or panel rather and that that speaks specifically to the charge master to the rates that are proposed and the reason for that the reason it's insulated and removed as part of the evaluation process is so that you don't have there's no opportunity for an entity to propose rates that are unreasonable to say propose rates that are significantly less than say the current rates are today given we understand where the, the reimbursement uh, environment is from our government payers, which make up whether it's fire-based service, the public uh, utility model, a hospital-based service. We understand at a national and global level where that's where that's at in this country and others. We wanted to separate the financial aspect with respect to the rates that are charged, so that someone couldn't submit an unreasonably low charge master to say, "Well, you're currently charged." hypothetically $2,500 for this specific type of transport. For this level of service, we're going to propose that we're going to charge $1,500 for that same level of service. Because on the surface, that may look good in part, but in retrospect, if you actually 
dial in the operating cost that it would take to run the business compared to what you'd be charging, there, there'd be a huge shortfall. And so that's why an independent CPA, someone that's not a part of the proposal review panel, is conducting that fiscal analysis piece. Madam Chair, the, the other reason it's a pass-fail on the financials is you also don't want to favor somebody just because they happen to be uh, a multinational and a, a $3 billion company when somebody else that's only you know a half a billion dollar company could do just as good a job, but we we incentivize something that has no material effect. So that's one of the reasons the financial is more of a pass fail. You have to have the threshold, but you don't have, you don't get more because you're way over the threshold. That's really the intent. Supervisor Williams, does that satisfy you on that? Point? Yeah, I'm, I wasn't specifically asking if for on financial. I was you know before I brought up on response times. I know you're trying to talk me out of it, uh, but uh, um, you know, I mean, you could also, uh, you know, uh, award um, uh, more on operational standards in general, or uh, uh, you know, cl clinical standards and administrative standards. I mean, I just, I just, I just wonder about that, all of that um, uh, as a sure. as a general rule. I, I just. I, I disclosed this to you in our call that I just, to me, uh, pass fail criteria alone seem to not cover the breadth of moving, of wanting to move the system into a more uh, innovative or um, operationally superior manner. Is that? Through, through you, Madam Chair, what I'm hearing is the, the innovation uh, section and scoring is might be too low uh, to carry the day for you because that's where all the things go to, right? You, you can have financial innovations. You, if you, somebody came up and said, listen, I, I can put rockets in my ambulance so I can cut my response time in half, that's an innovation, right? It, it doesn't really matter. Those are all evaluated. We're not, <laughs> <We're> not <laughs> But, but you, you get the point. It's really that's where it goes. It's not in the minimum threshold criteria. Minimum threshold criteria protects you from not have, from having people bid that are not capable or competent to bid these kinds of contracts. And it, it happens not so much now, but uh, a decade ago, you would have seen a lot of, of mom and pop swing um, for these larger contracts, and they just didn't have the capability or the competency for it. So these were the protection safeguards we built into them. Supervisor Hart? Yeah, I think Mr. Fuentes had hit it exactly right. I mean, the purpose of doing this RFP is because we had a static relationship. You know, there was, there was pressure to um, improve service through staff and the negotiation process over years. But, you know, this is in a significant leap forward in that pressure to try and get the best possible um, service to our community that we, we can through this RFP process. And so that, I think you're, you hit the nail on the head, you know, the innovation and um, improvement is what's driving this, the whole purpose of doing this, and, and the points should reflect that as well. So I think that um, at least future system enhancements are currently 10 points. Uh, is there a sense that this should be increased in terms of the scoring for the evaluation criteria? And then if we increase this, does it all, I mean, do we have to decrease something else, or how does that work? There, there again, we don't have a hard and fast position on the assigned numerical value of any one criterion or the broad categories themselves. If we want to increase or decrease or adjust any of these at, at really you know, our leisure, that's, that's something that we can do because it's a, it's a very transparent process. Once the final document's been provided to anyone that's going to su submit a letter of intent, then they're going to you know, they'll be able to rationally kind of go across the matrix and say, okay, this is assigned 10 points or five points or et cetera. So if we want to adjust that, then there's no issue. Yeah, but to your, to your point though, mathematically, yes, <laughs> because it, it would be very similar to inflation, right? We, we can't just add points, but it gets lost in the proportionality. So we'll, we'll have to make sure that it takes greater standing as the board's direction. But that may, that may cause some downstream adjustment as well to make sure that it does, it's not washed out. Yep. Supervisor Nelson? Yes, thank you, Chair Hartman. So on this, this point that we're talking about on the innovation side, there's the, the other piece of this that really means a lot to me. It's the integration part. 
you know, because what I've been seeing here is I think one of the reasons why I've moved forward with wanting to continue to be an advocate for this RFP process is because I know we could do better. And so it's not just new techniques, it's also new relationships and new management. Because I, I, I do trust AMR and our, our uh, fire service um, that they are integrating on scene, but I don't know if they're integrating holistically. And I know we have the LIMSA that's supposed to be kind of coordinating that, but we're not, right? Because we see the relationships and how it's devolved here, and I want to evolve that relationship and make sure it's a lot more, um, that works more smoothly in the future. And so again, that's really important to me in this, and that's where the RFP, I, I didn't see that. I, I haven't seen how do we have whoever's propose, make, proposing um, to us, is how do they make this better, you know, not only taking the great things AMR has done, but really um, maximizing the assets of our, our first responders who we, ha all of our jurisdictions have them already. And so we need to, you know, and we've heard before that 70% of their calls are medical. So if, if we're not fully integrating that into our, our system of EMS, then we're failing. And that's, and so that's really important. I don't know how that comes out in RFP. Again, that's why we hire consultants to hopefully be able to, to, to wordsmith that. But that's a really important portion for, for me in, in, dis, in deciding where we go from here. Supervisor Nelson, we do have that listed as an issue down below. Would you like to see it separate or could it be incorporated into system enhancements? It, it could. I mean, I, I think maybe, it, to me it's so important, it almost needs to have its own category within the criteria. And that's why, for me, when I was doing my notes this week, you know, this is a criteria and a question. I've talked to the consultants about that. How do we have something in the RFP, a category that addresses system integration? You know, how do we make that better? And, um, you know, I didn't see that. I wanted to, see, I think you guys maybe are already working on maybe some um, developing that into a criteria point. Um, and I'm, I'm really open to see what that looks like. Yeah, it, it's through you, Madam Chair. That, that's actually a larger integration issue. If we're going to talk about it and break it off as a group, that's integration with your community. That's integration with your hospital systems. That's integration with your first response systems and anything else that they can innovate on. So it's 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 part of that portion that you would have some descriptive value. Um, you know, they want to partner with the university or whatever. Those are all integrations that you'd want to see as an innovation, and we'll have to score that. Right. Uh, within that criteria. And so I don't want to, I don't want to see the integration get lost in, in, in innovation where you know we're right. trying to do cool new things where we're doing things with behavioral wellness and then all of a sudden that that dilutes the integration piece. Again, the integration piece for me from the very beginning has been one of the things that sold me on going through this RFP process and not sticking with the status quo because I'm really happy with the status quo, but I, I'm hoping for better and that's where we're, uh, integration comes into play. So uh, let me just get a sense of the board. Uh, if, if we would like to separate out the two, I'm, it's okay with me if, if you think you can do it. Um, how about the others? Das? Meaning uh, separate innov innovation from integration. Uh, integration. Uh, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Both are, are valuable and both should be more prominent in this RFP. Okay, so we have broad agreement that we'd like to have both. I, I guess then the question becomes, how should they be scored? Um, Chair Hartman, I, I think that's where we lean on on Fitch, right? I mean, you're, you're hearing how important that is to this board. Right. I think, you know, um, Limps is hearing how important this is to this board. So, you know, I don't know if I feel comfortable with saying, no, it needs to be 20 versus 10. Um, but I, again, I would go back well, to my consultant. Yeah, yeah, that's a good timing. Um, I, I would suggest, uh, Madam Chair, that we stick with the process that got us here, and that's really more of a committee role to figure out the actual points rather than have the board uh, have a public discourse on that at, at this stage. So I think you, you've set the policy discourse or the policy position. We'll take it from there and... and Excellent, yeah. thank you. Okay. For me, I would just put, put it like this. Like any imperfect system, I mean, there's, there's hard work, there's heroism, there's all sorts of things going on, but there's also, uh, you know, uh, duplication in some instances and lack of resources in others, right? That's, that happens out there. And, and what our, our RFP and our pointing system, point system to me should do is minimize those 
right? Um, to the extent that's that's possible, and that's what innovation uh, and system integration to me is are both all about. Um, Supervisor Nelson. Yeah, and I, I, I'm right there with Supervisor Williams. My only concern about it is if we put them in the same category, it may dilute one over the over the other. So I really want to get you know a full vetting now of what those two things look like. And I I think we mainly agreed with you. Uh, okay, um, so I think that is is. Are there any other issues with with scoring that remain? undiscussed. Okay, um, the review panel. And uh, Mr. Fuentes, why don't you set the stage? Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, what the Board of Supervisors, and I think, uh, I think there's a legal uh, opinion that could have also uh, set the stage just as elegantly. It really is about process here. It's what do you want to have as a representation uh, on there, and then the selection itself is not done by the board. It's actually done separately from that. You you set criteria. You say I need to have you know community involvement. They have to have a medical field. Whatever you want to include, we kind of process that out, and then the selection is done separately. What we can't have is anything that should look or could look like bias on, on that. That's really the intent of this, is to really separate that. So if there's ever a challenge on it, it's this was the criteria, and this is how that got, those individuals got selected. Here at the end. So summarize what is in the RFP as it stands. Certainly, uh, through you, Madam Chair. So the current committee is, or review panel, is composed of an EMS physician, and it, it says in parentheses, I've got it in front of me here just so I don't misquote, or other specialty knowledgeable of EMS best practices. And the reason for that is in previous procurements, we've had individuals ask whether or not th this specific position had to be board certified in uh, EMS, which is a subspecialty. And then you have two individuals experienced in high performance EMS system design and service. And what we have historically done for those two individuals is we have set forth a uh, a list of individuals that are what we would call bitter agnostic. So they do not have any ties to any potential bidder. They are experienced or are currently running uh, high performing EMS systems in other parts of the country, but they do not have any ties to any of the organizations that potentially could be bidding. So that they're very familiar as the EMS physician would be or the physician would be with the inner workings of an EMS system, the interplay between city and county politics, everything that encompasses an EMS system. And, and Supervisor Williams has a question on that. Well, uh, I mean, I was going to say that it sounds to me like one of these two positions, we could uh, ask that one of these two, posi two positions be in, in an agency where there has been uh, a public entity um, uh, running the system. They, there are some across the, the, the states. There's one in California, right? Um, so, um, And that's uh, certainly our intent. Okay, uh, okay so uh, then the two more, the two final ones? Correct, and then there are two designated community leaders. And to give you an example of what we've seen in other places, those individuals have been university presidents, they've been the president of the local Habitat for Humanity or a local institution, uh, an allied organization that has ties to the community, that has a lion's share of vetted interest in the community, and perhaps they're not familiar with the detailed, intricate idiosyncrasies that exist in an EMS system, but they, you know, they can understand based on what's proposed whether this passes muster or not or whether this meets the specification or not. And so that is what we have historically uh, done as part of our procurement processes. We, to, to give you an example, we had a, a specific situation where a municipality wanted to add one additional individual to the panel. And so we added an individual that was previously the assistant director of the FBI because they, they weren't a community uh, member. They weren't, say, experienced in EMS, but they were experienced in you know, high-performing systems, high-performing, high-reliability organizations, 
And so that was another individual that we proposed to, you know, kind of comprise the body of that review panel. So are the first three that you described likely to come from outside our county? Yes. And then the, the final two are likely to come from inside our community? That's correct. Supervisor Lavanino. So who selects those individuals, though? So, so historically, we have, as I said, we, we recommend that list. And in this sense, we would communicate that list uh, to the RFP advisory committee for their No, but I mean, OK, so you're talking about the names of the positions, though, correct? Or are you actually picking the individual individuals? Spe and... Yes, yeah, specific individuals. Now, for the community okay. leaders, obviously, right. the, the committee is going to have to provide those individuals because we're all from faraway places. Obviously, we're not from the local community, so we wouldn't we wouldn't opine on who those individuals would be. But for the first three, you would actually have a pool of names Correct. that would then go to the limbs. Okay. So, who picks out of the pool of you? So you provide you don't provide specifics. You provide a pool of names. Oh well, you know, um, I want to just bring up the idea whether whether uh, Fitch should actually bring forth one recommended person in each one of the positions. That's probably not a looked for uh, thing. Um, but well, there's, uh, a, there's a, I mean, we'll take your direction, of course, but there's a couple of different mechanisms to do that. One of the discussions we've had in the last week about this is whether or not um, there'd be more comfort if Fitch actually picked the names rather than the committee or the, or the LEMSA specifically. So there's, there's different mechanisms on that, uh, on how to get from point A to point B. Uh, so. so Supervisor Williams, you're, you would like to see Fitch at least do the first three, and I, I'd like to get some feedback from. Yeah, I'm good with that, but I'm curious, how do you get to the other two? Yeah. So. So let's do the first. Three. Yeah. OK, so yeah. So the first three. Yeah. I mean, you're the experts. Well, I'm not saying LEMS isn't either. They are as well. But I just think to divorce ourselves from this, it does seem like we kind of need an outside third party group to to and really you have do a this. lot of national right. expertise. I'm fine that with that. I think not... that that oh, takes okay. a lot of pressure off a lot of the internal. Okay, so that's the first three. <laughs> now we get to the harder part, but we would like Fitch to come up with names recommended for those. Um, what about the community members? Can we specify more criteria, how, how that gets done? You can, and certainly that would be something that's appropriate. Either the committee has to do it, or the board. Usually, you know, it's either zone geographic. We want one from the north, one from the south. It's it's criteria based. We you know we want somebody from I don't outside of a university system or uh, one of your leading industries. That's the kind of thing that usually we get guidance on. That that's really entirely uh, whatever you believe will give you the best representation of your community uh, on on this panel. That's that's what you're aiming for. And it doesn't have to be done today. I mean, I, I think you can work with the committee. They can try to help you come up with a, a, a few names and a few free criteria, and then you can work through that together. And Madam Chair, members of the board, I just wanted to clarify. So I know the example was local community leaders, but you could give direction to have it be local, regional, could be state, could be national. So it doesn't necessarily have to be local community members. And if you went more regional or state or um, national, then it might be more appropriate that Fitch could, again could select those and not have to rely on anyone to have to, to figure out the community leaders. Supervisor Nelson. Yeah, I'm still inclined to have local community leaders. I mean, I don't necessarily want to um, go out to somewhere else throughout the country to find somebody to be our, our community advocates here. And that's what we're kind of philosophically on the review panel. I'm still struggling because um, I think that there's a lot of policy in, in this and some of this is subjective. And if we're delegating that to a different group of people, it, I'm getting really uncomfortable. You know, I think the RFP is important, but equally as important is the review panel, you know, because it's through those eyes that, that the RFP is, is uh, you know, is viewed. 
And if there's, you know, those biases that come into play there, because there's all biases, I mean, we all have biases, um, that is going to help determine what this outcome looks like and then what, what we get back as a board to either accept or reject. And so um, something that I still struggle with. I, I have been saying for a long time, I love for it, this presentation for all, the five of us to be review panel. I don't know if that's possible, but um, probably not. But ultimately there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of policy in this and a lot of discretion. And so I, I want to tread carefully as we, we go through this review panel. Supervisor Lavanino. Thank you, and and I would say that the review panel is probably more important than than anything else that we've talked about because Including it is the board. Yeah, it is. But I think we've we've determined that we we can't do it, right? Am I clear about that we, that we, we cannot, cannot do that. We are clear. Okay, not that I want to, but um, you know I think there's a difference between. Um, Kind of like abdicating our our role, but we don't we don't we're not part of that role, so I don't feel like we're we're trying to pass it off on anybody. But to me, um, and I, I really do like I want to have somebody local, but at the same time, that individual is going to have those two people are going to have the pressure of the world upon them. I mean, we just saw what happened when we just barely went through redistricting and the pressure that we put on those people to make political decisions, and uh, so now you're going to have two local people that are going to have, <laughs> I can't even imagine the amount of stress that's going to be dropped on on a couple of uh, citizens. So I'm trying to figure out if there's, you know, I, I don't actually mind somebody else picking, but I, I just know what those folks are going to have to go through and it's not going to be good because there is going to be a winner and there are going to be some losers. And I don't know if I want to put somebody through that. Assistant CEO Mosnicic. Just another point that we considered as a committee and to make the board aware, you can also it's, you know, expand the number of individuals on the committee if you wanted to have additional community members and diversify those once we set the criteria. I mean, we can certainly move that to four. Um, all of that is also for discussion. Supervisor Nelson. Yes, thanks, Chair Hartman. Chair Hartman. So, who are we going to select these four people or two people? If I mean, I still don't have that clear yet. So we get to pick those two? No. no. Madam Chair, members of the board, you select the criteria. So um, as Ms. Mosnish said, you could increase the number in any of the categories or you could create new categories and you'd give the qualifications, give the direction, um, at least for the first three. The direction of the board seems to be that Fitch will select those. Um, you could have the review committee select the other ones, or you could have Fitch select the other people as well. But we still got to keep an arm's length distance from that as eventually the decision maker. Correct. Well, unless we can come up with some more ideas, I, I mean, I Maybe we can give a little more direction. I, I think Supervisor Nelson would like to see community members from our community rather than from state or, or national. Uh, I agree. Okay, so there seems to be agreement on that. Uh, and I gather that um, staff could go back and come up with some criteria, some categories, some more things to give us to think this through more clearly. Uh, would that be helpful? Yes, but I do like the idea of, at least for, you know, I mean, I th maybe it, there should be a north-south um, thing, um, uh, but in that, at least in my view, I know it makes it less likely that it's someone from my district, but having someone from the university system, I think, is an excellent suggestion, as has been done in some other areas. And I think we have education systems north and south that could be drawn upon. I mean, we've got some, you know, good, um, junior college program up there in the Hancock area that really touches this 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 area as well. So um, there may be somebody um, there at Hancock that might be a good um, person. I mean, and, and there's others. I mean, we've talked about, as you said, you know, the food bank or other nonprofits that should be looked at. I mean, we've got a very robust nonprofit organizations um, and CBOs um, in this county that I think could be relied upon. Um, and I and I know Steve. I know you're worried about. Pin them in the hot seat, but I think we had a, like 150 people apply to be on the redistricting commission. So, and nobody well, will next, next time. time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next time there'll be zero. So, uh, 
And uh, uh, the number, uh, is five a good number? Would we want to go to seven? What's, what's the sense of the board? I, I'm okay with another, you know, four people from the community to, to be balanced out by three professional um, you know, that have experience in, in this type of procurement. Um, I think that represents the, and again, making that sure that's uh, geographically um, spread out would be helpful. So, so you're suggesting seven and four community members. Mm -hmm. Is that allowable? We believe that would work with the state from what we understand thus far. So one of the one of the considerations with that, and it really comes back to the proportionality, right? These these are typically very complex, detailed uh, proposers, you know, that that put these together. And if you have a disproportionate um, non-expert, if you will, community members, then you may water down the level of expertise. So I would at least consider, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter to us if you want to expand the group or not expand the group, but I would consider the proportionality of, of content experts that are grading it versus community members uh, that are grading it at, at whatever relationship that is. But that's one, one concern I would have. Well, let me just ask first, do, do they, the, the, they grade this together in discussion? They don't just go off each on their own and grade it. Right. right. So, so they have, you know, typically, and each one can be a little different, but, but typically they have some, you know, individual time to read through all the enormity of the documents and then they get together face to face. But like any other group dynamic, non-experts may, may ask clarifying questions more often. And, you know, so you having some of the content expertise there, you know, is, is helpful so that you don't, you know, you don't, you don't want to have a group misinterpreting or trying to sway the other group because not everybody's on the same, same level playing field. It's, just, it's really group dynamics there. I mean, in, in my experience, the, if similar committees, the community people would kind of lean on the professionals a bit. So it actually kind of may counterbalance the fact that, that they're going to lean on, on their, on the, that expertise. I mean, uh, I, so correct that that is true, but that isn't actually generally what we hope for is the vast majority is scored individually. We do not want one strong leader in the room. Right. And I, I'm, I'm not going to pick on, on doc, but you know, physicians tend to have a lot of sway. So we tend to not want that sway to become the dominant sway in the room, right? So we want people to score almost everything individually and then ask clarifying questions. That's really, so, so yes, to some extent, but we wouldn't want them to go point by point having discussion on each point because then it's, it's going to be really one opinion that's going to carry most of the RFP. So that's the balancing act that, that we try to assist and make sure that the process is clean that it is evaluated individually, that it resonates with what your background is. So you should be looking at it from your community lens. That's what we want you to do. We don't want you to look at it from the medical lens. That's what the doctor's there for. And That's... the EMS guys are supposed to look at it from their EMS lens or the fire department so that everybody at the end, it's the consolidation of all those points of views looking at all the responses that gives us the best answer. So the answer is sort of. I'm not saying it doesn't happen because I, I, I've been through these enough that I know that some influence happens, but it's not what we're aiming yeah, for. That's an excellent point. Supervisor Lavanino. Thank you. And then, so just to help me with this, so, so it goes to the review, the review panel grades it. It then comes out of the review panel with a recommendation or with just, here's the scores? Through you, Madam Chair. So yes, it comes out of the review panel with a with a recommendation. So you have okay. the scores, and then you have the panel articulate their recommendation based off of the proposals that they both re reviewed that were written, as well as the oral presentations. Okay. And that's why there it's a it's a kind of two prong system. We've got the written response, which right. is going to be a several hundred page volume in many cases, and then you have the oral presentations. Right. Okay, and then so, it goes to LEMSA and then yeah, to us. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Okay, so then it comes to LEMSA. Does it, does it get another recommendation at LEMSA? I mean, let's say it goes to LEMSA and they disagree with the recommendation of the, the, the review panel. 
It, it's not supposed to. That's it's not supposed to. It, it, I'm, I'm trying to think if it's ever happened. <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then have you ever had a have you ever had a recommendation? Then it then it then LEMSA then brings it to the board of supervisors. Am I correct? And right, then they make the pro, final yeah, determination. They, they are the recommending body to the board. To the board. It's under under the jurisdiction. But have you ever had it where the board disagreed with the LEMSA recommendation? The board can throw it out. The board has total discretion okay. to say, "Listen, I don't agree at all right. with your recommendation." Start the process over again. Okay. Uh, we're just canceling it all. You don't. It, it's you don't have the this. You can't dig into the selection and say, "I want to pick number four of that," but you can say. So I it's a accept or reject. Yeah. Well, oh, let, okay. Thanks. Let the council answer that. Yeah. Yeah. So, should I answer that? And and, and just to be clear, uh, what are defensible reasons for doing that? Okay, Madam Chair, members of the board, I'm going to start back a little bit. So, um, the review process. The way it's set up currently, I think you've been given some options of how it's done differently, but the way it's set up in the RFP, each reviewer is provided a copy of the responding organization's proposal with written instructions on scoring. Each reviewer is expected to read and independently score each proposal prior to convening. So that gets to the question we had earlier. Um, each reviewer submits questions of the proposer to the review panel coordinator. These questions are presented in aggregate, anonymous manner to each proposer in advance of oral presentations, and additional questions may be asked during oral presentations. Following the oral presentations, the reviewers may adjust up or down their final proposal evaluation, but no more than one scoring level. Then the points awarded by each reviewer are totaled by section and given an overall quality points calculated, so total by each reviewer by section. And then it says, it makes it clear that uh, the LIMSA staff, nor the consultants, nor legal advisors shall serve as members of the proposal review team, and nor shall they score the proposals. So what happens after you go through the process and you get the scores, the final decisions made by your board following a recommendation from the Director of Public Health. So it's actually a little bit different. It doesn't come from the LIMSA, it comes from the Director of Public Health. Um, and then it's based on the, the scoring of the panel, which is done. They do, they do get together, but they've already independently scored and they're getting, they submit questions all at once so that it's, they're doing that independently as well. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out, I'm sorry. It, it, so I'm trying to figure out if, and maybe I'm, we're probably going into these hypotheticals, but if the Director of Public Health comes with a recommendation and the Board of Supervisors for some reason doesn't accept it, is it like a hung jury, you just start over, or what happens? Madam Chair, members of the board, well, it's similar to other processes that you would see where we go out for a public bid. Your board always retains discretion to reject all bids. Um, so you can um, reinitiate the process. Um, you actually have discretion during the process to decide not to go forward or to cancel. So that's similar to, to other requests for proposals that you've seen. Um, but. This one's a little bit different because this is setting up a different scoring system, which you're having input on. Oftentimes what you see is a statutory system that where you're like lowest responsible bidder and there's different statutory. So, so this one is different because there's, you're helping to set the categories um, and the points and then it'll get scored by the panel. Yeah, but the, the hard part for us, I think, is that we don't score it. So the things that are important to us, we don't, we're not scoring it. I'm giving it to somebody else to score it, and then I have to, to deal with it. And it's so weird in this situation because it's not a request for bid. We're not saying this is what we want you to do, and then you bid it. We're asking for new innovative ideas and ways to integrate and change our status quo. And then we are not really involved in what, What's important? They somebody could come up with something new and innovative, and it goes to the screening committee, and they're like, "Yeah, we don't really like that." Well, we may have liked it, but it's just a weird situation. Um, Super Raise Eleven, you know, a couple of thoughts on that. So, the way that the process is set up for you to communicate what's important is exactly what you're doing. So, you are communicating today to Fitch to which categories are more important to you. You know, how you want to change the scoring. So you do get input on how to prioritize what's important for the scoring committee. And also you are have the option to establish who's on the review panel. So for instance, on if innovations and integration to the system is 
top priority. Maybe you want to have a few more people on the panel that have the EMS experience. Um, maybe you make it equal. You know, the, the reviewers ended up, the scores end up getting totaled, and, and that's where it goes from there. So you, you do have discretion on the qualifications and the number of people on the panel. So I just wanted to follow up and then Supervisor Hart. So when it comes back to the board, do we enjoy full discretion about yay or nay on accepting the recommendation? Or do we have to have legally defensible reasons? And if the latter, what are they? Madam Chair, members of the board, um, you do retain full discretion to accept and approve the recommendation that comes to your board um, or to reject all bids. Um, it's a little difficult today since we don't have a set, we don't have all the set criteria yet, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure yet on that, on the second piece. I okay. need to give that a little more thought. Supervisor Hart and then Williams. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in the timeline. I asked that question earlier about, that was on slide 20 that I hadn't noticed. Um, but and that timeline's too long too, because I, I think I've made it clear that I want to be here. I was here at the beginning. I want to be here for, to help make this decision. So introducing community members into this is an equation that potentially expands the time. I think it's going to be a lot to ask people to get up to speed on this. This is very dense, very complicated. Um, you know, maybe we can add two, but four feels to me like that's asking a lot to recruit four people. You know, who can bring this you know level of expertise to this conversation, get up to speed on a short time frame and do this work, you know, is, is I, that feels like to me guaranteed too much time. So, so let me, so you would like to stay at five with two community members? It's, it's not a hill I want to die on. So I understand what your, your point is and, and that makes sense. I do like the geographic um, diversity of it. Um, I, I think education is a great place yeah. to pull from. Maybe. Okay, great. Supervisor yeah. Williams. Well, and I, I was going to wait for discretion, but, but since, the, the issue is brought up. I do think that we should have county council prepare language in in the RFP that clarifies that we have should have full discretion. We should look at it, um, and uh, and that you know because the people are sovereign over their own um, future. That means, and we're the the elected representatives of the people. That we can do so for any reason um, uh, that is in the interest of the people of the county. Right, and that might go under board discretion, the other issue down there. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I'm okay with, with five, and I, I'm also okay with us examining whether the timeline can be shortened, um, because I do think that that's an important thing. I, I uh, you know, um, yeah, it's taken us a lot to get here. We'd like to finish it off with Supervisor Hart. Uh, okay, so I think that covers the review panel. So the next is fleet requirements. And uh, again, could the Fitch team just give us a brief platform to jump off from? Sure, so much like the uh, scoring methodology and the scoring criteria, the fleet requirements are based on what we've used historically in other areas for other service procurements. Due to the recent upheaval in supply chain dynamics globally, uh, specific to cardiac monitoring devices, ventilator equipment, uh, vehicles in particular due to microchip shortages, we did include some specific provisions in this RFP so that whoever the awarded uh, proposer was could start the process or start the scope of work with uh, additional mileage uh, on their vehicles that we typically have not used historically. And that is there again specific to the fact that all of those things that I just mentioned are incredibly difficult to procure right now. And even in the event uh, many agencies are able to procure them, they're seeing lead times upwards of 19 months. And so that is why the specific uh, specification allowed for, say, a proposer to start the scope of work with you know, a specific percentage of their fleet having uh, 100,000 miles. 
maybe just, just to give you some context, Madam Chair, um, the reality is that traditionally, when we've put out RFPs, everything was net new. That's, and so if you, if, you didn't, if you don't know that context, then this doesn't make as much sense. It's just because of the context of the economy and the way the, the, the supply chain issues have affected everybody in the nation, that nobody's been able to get equipment and, and vehicles, we said, for this RFP, we're going to accept the fact that it doesn't have to be net new, because if you have to be net new, you're probably two years before you can really take this off the ground. That's, that's all it was. So um, I think we have some language that was proposed or, uh, by our um, council on this. Um, as part of the final contract, contractor will be required to provide to the LIMSA a list of all vehicles detailing make, model, age, and maintenance records. Um, does that satisfy what you think? Supervisor Williams? Yeah, I mean, I think the conflict here, it, it was whether the, the question was whether that stuff had to be there beforehand or after, after uh, you, know, accept, you know, acceptance of their proposal, right? Well, through you, Madam Chair. So what we have seen historically, if you do not have, say, a present, a set of maintenance records and bin numbers, make, model, et cetera, uh, much like we've done with the historical experience requirements, if you propose, here's what we're going to put into the system. We're going to put this make, this model, this many uh, quantity of ambulances or other resources, then that's that sufficiently meets that requirement. We were, to you, Madam Chair, we were attempting to allow a net new bidder to come in and bid. That's really what we're trying to accomplish there. Because if not, again, you're back to only the privates that already run ambulance right. services could, could come in and meet that criteria. So it's a little bit, um, and, and I'll, I'll say as a committee, we had a lot of debate around this because, because we recognize the shortage um, nationally. Um, and even for used vehicles, it's a competition. It's, it used to be that nobody bought used. You, you're, that's what you're buying now if you can get a low mileage unit. So, Ms. Van Mollum. Madam Chair. Um, Currently, the request for proposal says proposers shall articulate their intended fleet. So it's meant to be what they're intending to propose, um, not what they currently have. And then that language that you read off, I had just suggested a revision that um, it just makes it clear that it's as part of the final contract that the contractor has to agree to provide all of these things so that it's not, they don't have to have all the, the make, model, and maintenance records for vehicles they don't have yet. Right. And I'm not sure if the board's intent is to come back again to look at these changes or if you're wanting to give all direction today. I do have some proposed language that goes for the um, board's discretion. If you'd want me to say that now, I just wasn't sure if we're trying to wrap everything up today, if we're going to come back. Uh, I think the issue still, um, I guess maybe we gave enough on the review committee. Um, I think. I think we can try to wrap it up today. Let's see if we can get that far. Okay. Um, so I'll just let you know that the language um, that I think would address what Supervisor Williams raised is that it's differentiating the LIMSA's role and the board's role. So the LIMSA reserves the right to waive any immaterial informalities in the proposals and to waive any m minor irregularity in the submissions. The Board of Supervisors reserves the right to cancel in part or its entirety the request for proposal if it's in the best interest of the county to do so and to accept or reject the LIMSA's final recommendation. That's, that's what I was hoping for. Supervisor Lavanino? Yeah, I'm just making it, I just I need the clarification. So you can accept or reject it, you can't change it. So you would just stop yeah. the process and start over again if that was the case. Supervisor Lavenue, yes, that's okay, correct. Great, thank you. So Supervisor Nelson, is that language good for you? Supervisor Lavanino, good for you, good for me. Supervisor Williams, yes, Supervisor Hart. Okay, so we got another issue down. Uh, and the fleet language where we have um, what, what county council 
recommended. Uh, so we're just two issues left. Um, the community education. And again, Dr. Knight, would you just set the foundation for us on this? I think I'm going to have to turn that over to Thomas for the, okay. <laughs> if you want a better answer on that one. Madam Chair, can you specify the specific concern raised uh, with regard to community education? Do, uh, I, it has points, I believe, right? And it's um, and someone who's not doing it now, but doing related things. I mean, could you just expand on how it's being assessed? Sure. So much like uh, the other specifications in the RFP that speak to allowing the proposer to propose clinical innovation or innovation with respect to mental health transports or inter-facility transports, that's, that's really kind of the goal behind the community education and outreach and an overbroad engagement of the community uh, in the RFP, as stated in the kind of the original goals. So I, I just want to ensure is it a specific question as to... Can you remind me how many points that has? I will look at it and let you know. And uh, through you, Madam Chair. So this, this actually comes historically. Um, one of the things that we look for in the traditional RFP is education of your community at large on the use of the requirement and uses of your resources, right? As we recognize there's a scarcity of resource and these, these innovations that we brought in about a decade ago in the first couple of RFPs that we started to put this in, was that intent. You've got to go out and educate the community uh, on, on prevention, fall prevention, stuff like that, plus you need to educate them on how to use 911, the proper use, other tools available to you. That, that's the kind of innovation we're looking for um, so that you get eventually what your hope is, is through education is to have the right call or the right resource being used for the, the right situation. That's basically what we hope to look and read in, in, a, in, a, in a proposal. And the points? And then I'll add from a point standpoint, there are actually a few different criterion that you can address community education within. So for example, community health status improvement, that could be you know, proposing to teach stop the bleed training to every elementary school in the county or showing every high school student before they graduate how to use an AED. That would obviously improve the status of you know, community health throughout the community. Uh, there are other areas specific to uh, education and outreach that you could incorporate that in. So I, I wouldn't say that's necessarily a specific element within any one category. What we've historically seen is kind of an overbroad structure of how the proposers are going to engage the community in schools and religious organizations and civic organizations throughout various threads in the community. They've woven that into their various responses for the broader criteria within the scoring elements. So there isn't just a set of points, it's, it's diffused over different elements. Correct. There is so with, there is a specific criterion for community health status improvement. It's 25 points, but it's it doesn't speak to you've got to do this or you've got to do that. There are several other areas where you could propose innovative practices to engage the community. Okay. Well, I I think that's a really important one from my perspective, uh, both on uh, how you use the system. Uh, if somebody can drive you and you're not you know, you don't need an ambulance, maybe you shouldn't call one. And, and especially uh, getting out there and helping people stay healthy and, and right. teaching them how to use equipment. Uh, fentanyl is a really big issue right now, and Narcan, for example. So there's, there's many issues about um, dealing with emergencies by the community that can help save lives, and we want that information out there. Okay, uh, did anybody else have anything on community education or health assessment? All right, we are to the timeline. I think, is this our final item? It is. Yeah, because we already got integration of the system. So uh, do we need to walk this through in greater detail, Supervisor Hart? 
I talked with um, staff earlier and just made the point that uh, November 29th would be a better ending date than December 15th. Okay. And can we accommodate that pretty readily? Madam Chair, I think the, the key area where we need to do some work is finalizing the criteria that you've requested um, in speaking with for, the director. For the review panel, for the review, public members. Yes, remaining at five members, but spe specifying the criteria for the individuals on the community or the two community members. We need to do that. Uh, we believe we can do that during the break and come back to you with that language. And then if you could go up to the top, Lindsay, to see if there's anything else we're missing, because that will impact the timeline. Now just go all the way up so we can look at the notes, please. Okay, so to clarify, UCSB would not be part of this RFP at this point in time. They would be left status quo. Right. Correct. And then scrolling down. For stop the clock, we would, it's recommended by the board that you preserve the current system. So that's status quo. Response time remaining at 7.59, status quo. Okay, keep going. Go ahead and scroll down. Uh, financial, I believe we dealt with. We agreed that we would set up, we would construct language for a restricted fund, incumbent workforce, I'm looking to see if we need additional language there. We'll need to detail the language which expresses the board intent um, to ensure that uh, a protected workforce. And you gave us very, you gave us some additional language there in terms of how we. Would and there do was some, and it's mm -hmm. more general, but I think it. We ultimately concluded that that yeah. was all we could get to without. And I believe we can we can finalize that as okay. well at the break. Uh, keep going, scoring criteria. We'll create a separate category for integration versus innovation. And we will and, need to- And I think uh, the 10 for innovation w was not high enough, but right. we don't know how it fits within the broader context, so. We'll go back and look at how that works in terms of the overall points total and then creating a separate category specifically for integration and then looking at to looking at how to enhance um, the innovation component. Okay. Review panel, we're staying with five. As I indicated, and we'll go back and look at the criteria now, and I think you indicated uh, for community leaders, make sure that we have geographic diversity, we look at academia, we look at industry leaders um, as some of the uh, viable criteria. And then continue to scroll. Fleet requirements, we have language from council. Board discretion, we have language from council. Community education, I think that was clarified. So I think what we can do, Madam Chair, is while there is a break for closed session, we can go back and do our best to refine each of these areas. Fitch and Public Health, LEMSA, can work on that and we can solidify these and then come back. We could have okay. a little time to do that. And then the, the other point that I had, there were some typos and things that were brought forward in the uh, fire um, table that we received as a public document. And just hope those would be this. reviewed and incorporated as appropriate. Uh, I don't see any other lights up here. Are we prepared to um, hear what we're gonna do in closed session and ask staff to go back and deal with our comments? Yeah, are they going to include any suggestions to shorten the timeline, is that? They've got the end date, so I think they'll work back. I, I think what will be important is that we don't have to have it back here that we can finish today uh, for the board and uh, I, I think it's been very important to come back to the board I feel much better about this process having had an opportunity to at least have my say I think my fellow board members feel the same so and we really appreciate Fitch coming here on planes and uh, 
being with us today to answer questions and help draft the final language here. Uh, I, I, do we need a motion or we just wait until you come back? Um, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, we could just trail this. I okay. think we've gone through each of the items and then the staff can incorporate that. Okay, and then closed session is, um, do you have to talk, tell us? So, oh, uh, Madam Chair, I was just gonna say, because everybody, they're not gonna wait around, I don't think everybody's gonna wait around until we come back from closed session. So just uh, for the public's perception, we're just going to incorporate these changes, County Council, while we're on break, and then we're gonna come back and vote on do we have to vote at the end of that, or is it just? Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, there are a few actions you need to take. Um, well, there's the contract extension with AMR. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before you do that, you need to adopt the policy, the AB 389 policy, so that's on the agenda. And then on the um, direction on the RFP, I think it's agendized that you could just direct these changes to be made and then start to work with the state from yeah. there. Um, let's see. I was just gonna say, should we do, just do a, uh, what do we do those times? Uh, conceptual. conceptual motion so that folks kind of know which direction if they're not paying attention, I guess. It's pretty obvious what we're doing, but if not, so that people don't have to wait around for, we're gonna be in closed session for a long time, I think. So in the presentation that was made, there was a, um, the first slide was recommended actions. We could put that up there. And I'll make a motion that we move these recommended actions with the direction that board is given on a number of uh, different aspects of the RFP that were highlighted up on the, um, for the public's benefit, highlighted up on the overhead. Second. And is, is that okay, Ms. Van Mullum? Madam Chair, members of the board, yes, that's fine. Then the action would be adopting the resolution um, 389, approving the Fifth Amendment to the AMR contract. But then my question is, um, and then you're authorizing the public health director to do the actions um, in accordance with the agreement. But D actually is two. You are, you provided staff with direction on further development of the RFP. Are you also authorizing it for issuance or are you wanting it to come back at another date? So are you approving it with these changes? I guess that's the only My question. My assumption is we're approving it with these changes. Yes, Otherwise, we, we're gonna we don't want it the, to come back again. Right, we're gonna script the Because we, we need, yeah, we need the time to move more quickly. Yeah. So then just the clarification with the motion would just be that, um, you would be consistent with your direction. You provided staff to make the recommendations that were outlined on the screen. And also you are approving and authorizing issuance of the RFP. Um, and of course, not part of the motion, but just for your information, it goes first, it, they'll make the changes and then it will go to the state for approval. So that's the next step before it would actually go out issued. So we, we had a motion and a second. I've got or, a question. Yeah, Supervisor Nelson. Thank you, uh, Chair Hartman. I think we, we may have list, missed one of the, the rows. Wasn't there an issue about whether we're gonna deal with the ordinance? Is that something we're gonna direct oh, yeah. to come back at another time? Is that something, is that the direction we decided to go on that? Good ordinance? catch. Yeah, we did miss that one. Chair Hartman, members of the board, I didn't hear an actual motion. I heard the uh, motion direction, but did we have an actual motion and second I, from the board? I did have one, but I want to pull it back for a minute because we still need to discuss ordinance versus resolute. And I, need, I need to understand this a little bit better. So, Madam Chair, members of the board, so when we had that topic come at the beginning, I'm not exactly sure the question you're asking, as far as resolution versus ordinance, so what you have before you for AB 389 is a resolution. Um, the statute allows you to adopt the same policy by ordinance, but that was not, it's not set up that way today. 
Um, my recommendation would be to go forward with the resolution because you need to take action on the AB 389 policy before you approve the contract extension. So that would be my recommendation for today. If you wanted to come back in the future to either consider converting that into an ordinance, that's something that you could consider. Um, or if you want to consider in the future amendments to Chapter 5, but that's not agendized today. Right. So you can't really consider that today. Something to consider in the future. Um, it's really separate from this RFP process. You don't need to update Chapter 5 in order to go forward with the RFP. Um, and I know that there were some proposed amendments that were provided to you. Uh, if you're interested in pursuing that, my recommendation would be that um, you just direct staff to look through that. That's, it's quite a few changes. And our, amend, our chapter five is, is pretty outdated. It was adopted um, before the state EMS Act, which is why we cite to the state EMS Act instead of chapter five. Um, I think chapter five was in the 70s and then state EMS was um, 1980. I think it's so I think that's a bigger process than and, and you're not agendized to do it today. So I think your decision Understood. today so is whether you I'm want to look at that in the future. Yeah. Some direction to, to continue to look at that and, and update that and modernize that. I think as, well, as while we're going through this process, I think in you know five or 10 years from now, we'll look back and go, why didn't we update chapter five when we went through this whole process? I think so we should be looking at that as well concurrently. Supervisor Williams. Well. Um, my suggestion is that any one of us has the ability to agendize something. Uh, perhaps some of us should take it upon themselves to consult with staff about what kind of ordinance changes would be needed uh, to complement this effort. And uh, to um, uh, if, if there's some that are particularly high priority, uh, then we would um, take it upon ourselves to agenda, to ask the chair to agendize an item. That, that works for me. Okay, so. And I, ha and I had one more question about, I'm sorry to make this long. I know Steve hasn't eaten yet, so. Um, I'm not planning on it either, okay. man. Yeah, I'm good. Um, uh -oh. I know this is kind of a, an, an uh -oh. awful, awful uh, suggestion. Hey, you may have changed overnight, but I'm planning on eating. <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, the, uh, you know, we're going to send this to Kelly Imsa. And we made some really substantive changes here. And there's no promises that they'll accept these changes. Is that, am I kind of correct understanding that? Is that? Well, yes. I mean, we can't we can't allocate their decision for them. But I would suggest that most of the things that you requested aren't overly substantive. Uh, I think the scoring uh, would probably you know garner some attention, but. Uh, most of it, you know, it, restoring response times and things like that shouldn't, I mean, they'll, they'll have to review it, but I don't think that would be problematic. Okay, thank you. So do we want an out clause that if it goes to Cal Emsa and gets changed again, would we bring it back here before we issued it? I, I definitely want that, because I, my my opinion on this whole entire process would, would be altered by that decision if Cal Emsa went down that, that route. I think that makes sense to me too. Okay, so I'll make a conceptual motion. Oh, Before you do, do we need, could we separate out the contract extension with AMR? That isn't a conceptual thing. That's an actual yeah. thing. Yeah, Seems like we can just do that. Forward. And I just want to express um, gratitude. appreciation yeah. and gratitude for AMR rolling up their sleeves and doing that. You know, we're trying to be transparent. We're trying to make this um, work for everybody, and that's uh, greatly appreciated. Very much so. Okay, I will. Uh, I'll move um, the staff recommendation A, which is adopting the resolution, adopting the policy. Um, and here we go. From the clerk, A, B, and C. <laughs> That's A, B, and C. Okay, let's do. Uh, we'll move recommendations A, B, and C. Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay, then I'll make a conceptual motion that we will go ahead and move items D, which is D, I, and double I, and also E that is not a project in your CEQA. And with Madam, staff recommend it, with staff, with the input that we gave to staff for direction. And Madam Clerk, would you call the roll on that? M Madam Chair. 
Before you call the roll, I'm, I'm just checking. Why are we, are we conceptual motion? Because we are trailing it to come back. Yeah. Just check. I just don't want people to have to wait two hours. Okay. All right. Supervisor Hart. Aye. Supervisor Nelson. Aye. Supervisor Lavanino. Aye. Supervisor Williams. Aye. And Chair Hartman. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Uh, so closed session. Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, for closed session today, you are scheduled to consider public employee performance evaluations for the directors of the following county departments, agricultural commissioner, behavioral wellness, child support services, community services, fire, general services, human resources, planning and development, probation, public defender, public health, public works, and social services. You also have conference with labor negotiators, employee organizations, all bargaining units, unrepresented employees, managers, and executives, and the agency designated rec representatives are CEO Mona Maya Sato and Human Resources Director Maria Elena de Grovera. In two hours, so 5.30. The, the time estimate is two hours, is that correct? Yes. All right, two hours, we come back.
So after closed session, we're reconvening the May 31st meeting of the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors. County Council, would you report out from closed session, please? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. The board met in closed session for employee performance evaluations for directors of the following county departments, Agricultural Commissioner, Behavioral Wellness, Child Support Services, Community Services, Fire, General Services, Human Resources, Planning Development, Probation, Public Defender, Public Health, Public Works, and Social Services, and also with labor negotiators for all bargaining units, unrepresented employees, managers, and executives, and the board took no reportable action. And ACEO Masnisich, would you uh, get us started on the RFP for this session? Yes, Madam Chair, good evening. Uh, staff has made the changes that you directed. Um, many of the substantive changes have been made. I will say that staff, um, actually Mr. Moore, will walk us through the actual RFP so that you can see how we've represented those changes and the language that was provided. I will say that cleanup and tying in all of the interrelated sections and making sure that everything ties has not been done. So while we've incorporated the changes, we still need to go back and do one quality assurance check before we actually release, and we anticipate that to take at least several more days. Um, so with that, if I'm correct, I believe I'm turning it over to Thomas at this point in time. Or Vaughn. Thomas, OK. And we'll physically scroll through, and we've highlighted the changes for you. Go ahead. Good to go. All right, Madam Chair and members of the Board of Supervisors. So the first change is the uh, including of the uh, UCSB portion that we discussed. And so there are not necessarily any language changes with the exception of language in uh, Section 1.4B, which is going to be removed and augmented. Uh, the main change Can is going to be- Can you point us to the page? Sure. So, this section here, the service area section, is going to be modified. We modified it in the Word document, but it's not copying over to the uh, PDF. In essence, we're going to define a new map that has the requested changes for UCSB on the map uh, that's in the appendix. But I did just want to point out that there was going to be a change to this service area section here from a language perspective. What's that? I do not know. There are a few highlighted changes where I can see them on this end, but when they PDF'd it, um, it didn't carry. We can. We just want to make sure the highlights are reflected on the screen. Is that the one? Um, yeah. Okay, good. And you know what? I think we'll just go through it like this. Sorry. Okay. Where is the view? We can just scroll through it like that. Okay. And that should happen. And Madam Clerk, is this document available for the public? Chair Hartman and members of the board, yes, this document has been posted online and has been made available to the public here in Santa Barbara. I would note that, unfortunately, um, the uh, track changes were approved, so the uh, document that has been posted online does not show the red line version, but we can change that now. Um, we'll make that change now. Okay. So you are on page six on the service yes. area, yes. and that's going to be changed. Yes, page, so all of this, I'll just do it in real time here to make it easier. This is what it shows on our end, to be exact. 
which are that Vandenberg Air Force Base and UCSB are excluded from this RFP. You can go ahead and continue to scroll through. Okay. Question, I'm sorry, Thomas. So it's really hard to see. So that blue, you have all that crossed out. So B service area, that's all crossed out except for, okay, so it just says Vandenberg and UCSB are excluded from this RFP. That's what we need to know under service area. See? Okay, got okay. it, Great. thank you. We don't thank have you. the blue, so it's, or, or the, I see. Cross out. Correct. So this this is updated in a corresponding map in the appendix uh, with the map of the county will be updated. Okay. The next change uh, is with respect to the response time extensions, which have been referred to as stop the clock agreements uh, throughout today's session. So let me zoom in here a little bit more on page nine. Page nine, section C. And Supervisor Nelson, you have a question on this? Yeah, <clears throat> this is the one I've been struggling with. Um, so it memorializes where we're at now and moves up forward for the life of this contract. Is that what the, the, the vision is? And can you remind me again, how long is this contract for? Seven. Okay. Sorry, at, at this hour I've already been. Uh, sure. Um, yes, uh, through you, Madam Chair. They, they're traditionally five years, and then they have extensions built in uh, for it. Um, yeah, but this this one's seven with that three years. Yes, yes, but it has seven built in up front. So. And so this assumes that the fire department's agreed to provide that service to the future awardee. It, it, that is the one um, question mark, but yes, it makes the assumption because we put it as a shall. Okay. Uh, so it's a, it's a must have in order for them to get, if not, they have to supply. If, let, let, let's put it the other way, uh, uh, council member. If they can't get the agreement, then they would have to meet the 759 themselves. Somewhere else, okay. Right. Great, thank you. Or, yeah. I guess my concern would be moving on you know, that 1.4 makes sense, that's today. 10 years from now, 1.4 probably doesn't make sense. C correct, and what we did, is, sorry, through you, Madam Chair, what we did with this language was to actually just put it as an RFP placeholder. It doesn't even commit them to, to, to that point. It could be more expensive when they negotiated, but they needed a point of reference so that every bidder, if Acme Ambulance Company that doesn't know anything about you has to bid, this gives them the point of reference to bid, so everybody bids that number. Thank you for that clarification. Any questions specific to this? Okay. So the next section will be the proposal review panel. Page 24 should be. Um, on page 14, you had the language. Um, With the board discretion? Yeah. Certainly. So we did modify this uh, at the direction from earlier to clarify the LEMSIS authority and the Board of Supervisors authority. And then on the next page, I guess you've, you've modified the dates for the October deadline. Mm Chair Hartman, can you repeat your requests again? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just, I saw that on page eight, uh, page 15, the dates have been modified. 
So that's um, following the direction for the timeline. And then on my copy, I don't see anything changed until um, page 30. Madam Chair, 24, it does, it's not highlighted in yellow, but that language has been changed, I believe. Okay. Because it reads the way uh, the that we- The review panel, okay. The way we... So that would be section D3, I, I, I. the two designated community leaders representing geographic diversity, North and South County, academia and major industry service provider that demonstrates innovation and best practices and operational excellence. Okay. And that, okay. the following paragraph as well. Okay. 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 Any questions? No. No. I, I had page 30, the um, system integration innovation. Uh, okay. yeah. Correct, correct. So we developed an additional category for system integration and system innovation, uh, which will be 10.1 and 10.2. Those were incorporated into the uh, matrix for uh, point criterion assignment, as well as uh, sections that were developed into the RP following section nine. So as we continue through the table here, 10.1 for system integration uh, was assigned 25 points and 10.2 for system innovation was assigned 35 points. And to be clear that uh, the system innovation was already identified as a clinical that was the one that didn't have enough scoring. So we added innovation as a separate category and allowed for a larger uh, spectrum of innovations, including operational innovations, technological innovations, and others. So it wasn't just clinical. And that represents about a 10% of the total score now is weighted into innovation. So it gives you a better chance. And uh, with the addition of the um, integration, that's another 7%. So about 17% now is innovation integration of the total RFP score. So that was what the objective was. Okay. Any questions? No. No. Okay, the next change is on page, well, we did remove this last sentence here on page 34 that previously under section 3.2 read that the arrival of a BLS unit and an ALS assignment does not stop the response time clock. And that's based on the extended uh, response time language that we changed in the earlier section. Next change is going to be on page 45. Within the uh, Article A for ambulances. That's our 44. 44. That's where the section starts, but the specific change is on 45. We, we added language to include that as part of the final contract, the contract will provide uh, a list to the LIMSA of all vehicles detailing make, model, age, and maintenance records. So this is the, the new language here. Good. Next, which should be the treatment of the incumbent workforce on page 48. The following modifications were made. All of paragraph two and three uh, were uh, removed, and the first paragraph was modified 
to read that the winning proposer will be encouraged to recruit from the incumbent paramedic and EMT workforce. And accordingly, a proposer shall describe their plan to recruit and hire the incumbent workforce, or as applicable, their plan to retain and prevent attrition of the incumbent workers. Any questions? So then beginning on page 51, uh, to reflect the extended response times from the stop clock agreements, the response times were modified for uh, urban, rural, and wilderness areas to remove the two minutes. That should be the last change. I will add that on page 80, it does go into detail uh, to speak to the specifics for 10.1 and 10.2 for the system integration and innovation, which is essentially a proposing statement of what the proposers shall propose uh, with respect to integration and innovation. And is that it? That is all. So I had a question on the fleet. Um, I see you, you've put in when the contract is final, then you have to give all that information. I, I thought we had language about um, reflecting the intent of what kind of fleet so that it didn't disadvantage a bidder who didn't have an existing fleet. Well, and that was why we modified it to say at contract award, so that if you didn't currently have those vehicles, then at the time of award, I see. If you had okay, an, if you had a so PO, that's how you handled it. Not okay. I was looking for a different language. Got it. All right. And uh, county council and Madam Chair, I think what you're referring to is that it was existing language. It says the intended fleet, but then we also added um, as part of the contract. I was just wondering if we could go back to the review panel section. Could you tell us what page? In the original, it was, it's 23, but I think it might be 24 now. It, it is 24, I think. Yeah, I'll, I'll get there. It's a little slower on this side. So I just wanted to clarify. So it just talks about geographic diversity, academia, and major industry service provider. And I think we just those were examples, I think. So I just wanted to make sure that was we weren't trying to get someone that had all of those qualifications in one. So I think there was a discussion of maybe just such as academia, or, so that we yeah. wouldn't be have any question about that. I'd, I'd be more comfortable. Right. We that. actually. We actually had that conversation with with Brian. I think the version control messed that one line up. The intent is still there, but it, it did have a EG example of of what the kinds of qualifications would be. Yeah. Certainly. And then also, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, and maybe uh, Fitch and Associates is going to talk about this. But you know, we we 
these are all of the major changes that you made, but we're going to need to go back through, make everything consistent. Right. So there's going to be some other tweaks here and there, but it'll be consistent with the direction your board's giving today. Give us just a minute to Okay, any board members have any final thoughts about this? So this will be our last go at it, assuming that we don't get a lot of changes from the state that require it to come back. Dr. Del Reynoso. Yes, I just um, wanna thank the board for this um, very intentional and fruitful conversation and for the guidelines that you've provided. Um, as your department head, I will do my due diligence in assuring that we follow through this process with integrity. And that's, that's the assurance that you can expect that from our, our team. And we never would have questioned that. And we're so grateful for all the work that everyone has put into this, and, and especially Fitch for coming out uh, in person and meeting with us on the phone and just giving us a, 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 a different perspective on everything from nationwide. That, that helped enormously. So uh, I think we're a go. And uh, yes, the we need to trans from a conceptual to an actual motion for the direction. Sure, I'd like to uh, make a motion. I, uh, I think we're D two. one and two plus E. I'm looking at this. That we would uh, approve and authorize issuance of the RFP. I guess we don't need to provide staff with other direction. That's already been done. So we'll just move D, I, and um, then also E, where it's CEQA exempt. I think for the record, you want to say, uh, as has been shown. As has been shown and quoted by Supervisor Williams. And I just want to get a nod from our county council and our clerk. So Madam Chair, just so that the minutes are really clear, um, I think you would just want to say um, that you're approving and authorizing issuance of the RFP with the changes made today, as well as the minor changes that incorporate um, the direction of the board that um, gave staff today, and then of course the CEQA. That's my intention, that's my motion. Second. And Madam Clerk, one more time, call the roll. Supervisor Hart? Aye. Supervisor Nelson? Aye. Supervisor Lavanino? Aye. Supervisor Williams? Aye. And Chair Hartman? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, with that, we are adjourned to Tuesday, June 14th um, for our budget hearing. <laughs>